Good evening. I'm Mayor Jen Wallison and welcome to the Menlo Park City Council's May 9th special and regular City Council meeting. This is a hybrid meeting with City Council, City staff, and members of the public participating in City Council chambers. Please note that public speaker time may be limited depending on the number of speakers on each item. I would like to introduce City Council members and staff present. Vice Mayor Cecilia Taylor, City Council Member Drew Combs will be joining us directly in closed session. Council Member Maria Doerr is here as well as Council Member Betsy Nash. Staff present includes City Manager Justin Murphy, City Attorney Neera Doherty, and City Clerk Judy Heron. City Clerk Heron, will you please provide instructions to the City Council and members of the public on how this meeting will proceed? Yes, thank you, Mayor Willison. And again, echoing a welcome to our May 9th special and regular meeting. For members of the public who wish to provide comment on any of tonight's item, if you are participating virtually after the mayor calls for public comment on that item, we ask that you engage that hand feature in the bottom of your screen. If you're calling in from a landline or a cell phone, you can press star nine at that time. And if participating in chambers, please complete a speaker card at that back table and return to me at the clerk's desk. That concludes my instructions at this time. Mayor Willison, you may continue. Thank you, City Clerk Karen. And at this time, uh, will you please call for public comment on the closed session item C1? Yes. So for any member of the public who wishes to provide comment on our closed session items C1 or C2, which is closed session conference with labor negotiators or uh, C2 conference with legal counsel for existing litigation, please engage that hand feature in the bottom of your screen Calling in from a landline or a cell phone, please press star nine. If participating in person, please complete a speaker card at the back table and return to me at the clerk's desk. And this will be the final call for public comment on our closed session items C1 and C2. Seeing no hands or cards, Mayor Willison, you may continue. Thank you very much. So for the members of the public, the City Council will now be adjourning to our closed session and will report out immediately following closed session. We are anticipating reconvening to the regular meeting at 6 p.m. So we'll be back in 55 minutes. Thanks so much.
Okay. Good evening, everyone. If you can please take your seat for those in council chambers. We are reconvening the meeting. We've just been in closed session. And at this point, at 6.06, .06, I would like to reconvene the May 9th city council meeting. And then I can promote you. We are now moving on to agenda review. Uh, agenda review provides advance notice to members of the public and city staff of any modifications to the agenda order and any requests from city council members under city council member reports. So before I ask my colleagues if there's anything they wish to pull or modify, I am going to announce that we are going to do a little reordering at the beginning here. We're going to go ahead with our proclamations first. Then we are going to have our presentation from the UC Berkeley Go Bears um, grad student teams and then, sorry, and then um, go from there. So do any of my colleagues um, have any items they wish to pull or reorder? Okay, great. Um, so now I would like to do a report out from closed session, um, item F. So I would like to introduce our city attorney, Neera Doherty, for a report out from the April 25th and tonight's closed session, item C1 and C2. City attorney Doherty, any reportable action? Thank you, Madam Mayor. There is no reportable action. Thank you very much. So we are now moving on to G, public comment. Under public comment, the public may address the city council on any subject not listed on the agenda. Each speaker may address the city council once under public comment for a limit of three minutes. And depending on how many speakers we have, that, that could change. You are not required to provide your name or city of residence, but it is helpful. The city council cannot act on items not listed on the agenda and therefore the city council cannot respond to non-agenda issues brought up under public comment other than to provide general information. I will be calling for public comment at the appropriate times for members of the public to address the city council on any item under agenda sections, presentations and proclamations, consent calendar, regular business and informational items. And with that, City Clerk Karen, can you please call for general public comment? Yes, thank you, Mayor Willison. So at this time, if any member of the public wishes to provide comment for an item not on tonight's agenda, if you are participating virtually, please engage that hand feature in the bottom of your screen. If you're calling in from a landline or a cell phone, please press star nine. If participating in person, please complete a speaker card at that back table and return to me at the clerk's desk. And our first speaker will be Roland Lebrun, followed by Rick DeGolia. Yeah, it's on now, right? Okay. My name is Roland DeBrand. I live in uh, San Jose. I uh, addressed you on uh, the COID zone issue two weeks ago, and then I listened to various comments that you made. What I'm here is to follow up on some of the comments that you made. And I'm also currently working on the letter, which is somewhat technical. It should be ready by the weekend. Next slide, please. So um, the first thing is one of the comments was we don't want to install anything that's going to be obsolete by the time we install it. Well, the presentation was already obsolete because the consultant was talking about embedding loops uh, in, in the tracks, which is similar to the Caltrans loops when you get onto an on-ramp. And here are the issues with this loop. They work fine with cars, but uh, uh, they don't work uh, with uh, pedestrians, uh, bicycles. Uh, I can barely read this. Uh, strollers, skateboards. Um, and then if a car, as you probably know, makes a right turn onto the tracks, well, the loop thinks, oh, okay, the car's gone. We're all set. You know, we can close the gates. Well, no, there's a car that's stuck there on the tracks. Um, and then they got issues uh, with, with weather and they classifies as intrusive because it actually, they actually uh, uh, create a lot of uh, damage when you sold them. And I need to move on because I got a minute and a half left. So next slide, please. So the, the proper solution is radar. And, and, and quite frankly, I would leave that to somebody else. This is something that's going to be done system-wide uh, when Caltrain is ready to uh, bring up the track to the next track class, which is called Class 6. So next slide, please. 
So what I want to show you is something that somehow, this is your RFD, something that somehow fell off the tracks. It's a uh, wayside horns. Next slide, please. And I'm going to show you examples. So that's basically what you have. That's what it looks like outside. You basically just have a speaker where the arrow is. That's it. Next slide. That's before, and that's the decibels being measured. Next slide. Well, that's after. That's the difference. You can go back and forth and you can see difference. So let me show you the, another example. Next slide. That's before. Next slide. After. You get the idea. And I'm going to give you uh, one more example and then wrap up because my time's up. So that's before. That's a golf course. And then after. So you see the difference. They're actually less loud than the bells. So let me wrap up here and show you really where you want to go in the long term, which is the last slide, which is the vision. That's your viaduct. That's currently is getting built uh, just north of London. And I'll be working with um, a Berlin game on making sure that's what they're going to get. And then you'll be able to look at it and that'll be yours too. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Our next speaker is Rick DeGolia, followed by Renee Barnstone. And this will be the final call for public comment for items not on tonight's agenda. Mayor Wollison and members of the council. Hi, my name is Rick DeGolia. I'm a member of the Atherton City Council. I've been on the council nine and a half years and I've been on Peninsula Clean Energy's board since we formed the company in about 2015. We take on this job as being council members because we want to be represented and we want to represent those constituents who elect us to our positions. It's often a thankless task, as you all know. But what makes it really valuable and really changes the dynamic is when we can change the quality of people's lives, which we can't do very often, but there's sometimes we're able to do that. And when I've done that, I've felt like it totally made the entire effort and time commitment incredibly worthwhile. And the one thing that I found that I've done that really dramatically changed the quality of people's lives was when we established a quiet zone at Fair Oaks Lane in Atherton, which is the first quiet zone established on the Caltrain tracks. And we did that by declaring the quiet zone because we had put in quad gates. We didn't know that we could have a quiet zone. In fact, we were told we couldn't uh, by Caltrain because we'd had some suicides in the area. Turned out to be completely wrong. We were able to declare a quiet zone because the Federal Railroad Act had approved the safety measures that if you put them in place, the trains didn't have to blow their horn in order to protect people's lives and reduce the noise. The amazing thing about it is I got so many emails from people after we established that quiet zone, and many of those emails came from people that really didn't understand that their lives were going to change when those horns stopped to blow when they came up to the tracks, uh, up to the crossroad. And that's because in their lives, they got used to to the noise of the horn. You live with it. You live with it night and day, and you get used to it. But when it stops, you suddenly realize that there's a really dramatic quality change in your life. And I heard from more people as a result of that change than anything that I've done in the nine and a half years on the Atherton Council. Um, I'm proud uh, that I was mayor when we established that first quiet zone, and I was mayor when we decided to move forward on the second quiet zone, which is getting implemented this year at Watkins Avenue. We're going to extend the Fair Oaks Lane quiet zone as soon as we have quad gates into uh, Watkins Road. We, we don't need anyone's approval to do that. We certainly need people's approval to put the quad gates in. But once we've got the quad gates in, it, it's our ability as the decision-making authority for our jurisdiction to declare a quiet zone. And we're going to do that. Caltrain knows it. We've been very clear about it. And I'm proud about it because of the way that it will change people's lives. So I encourage you to go forward. Uh, I know it's expensive. I totally understand the issues with that. But... I just want you to know from my perspective as a council member how dramatic that change was in terms of uh, both 
how I felt, but how much it changed other people's lives. It was a big deal. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Our next speaker is Renee Barnstone, followed by David Wortelli. Hello, and uh, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak. My name is uh, Renee Barnstone. Know. Could you move the microphone a little closer to you? Sure. Thank is that you. a little better? That's better. Uh, my name is Renee Barnstone. Um, I live on Stone Pine Lane, and um, I'm really looking forward to the quiet zone changes. I moved to California oh, five years ago, and I've been on Stone Pine Lane ever since I moved here, and it is really uncomfortable to have to listen to it all day long. I was sharing with somebody else that I have a handy sheet for visitors who come to stay with me, gives them like my Wi-Fi password and everything. And it also warns them that um, these uh, the horn starts at 5 a.m. and it doesn't stop until 2 a.m. Um, and there's certainly periods of the day where it's constant. And um, contrary to what was just said, um, I've never gotten used to it. And I really look forward to the opportunity where I uh, miss it. <laughs> So I just wanted to share that, that I'm a favor. I'm speaking on behalf of all of my neighbors. Um, it's really a difficult situation and I'll do whatever I can to lend whatever support to you know, make sure that this happens, but I'd really like to see that change. So thank you. Thank you for your comment. Okay, and I was uh, just notified that uh, Quiet Zone is going to be related to our CIP, which is J1. So uh, thank you, David, for pointing that out earlier. I misspoke when I uh, thought it was item G. So I'm going to put uh, your comment on the correct item, which is J1, regarding our CIP. Um, but I will continue taking general public comment for items not on tonight's agenda. And our uh, next speaker will be A. Williams. Hi, um, I am a local community member and I'm living off of Noel Drive, um, basically right across from the Caltrain station. And I recently received a notification of the movement for the quiet zone. And I'm um, here- to make the interruption. Um, this, if you're speaking on the quiet zones, that's actually gonna be a future agenda item this okay. evening, uh, item J1. Okay. So we'll ask that we'll hold your comment until we get to that item. Oh, okay. Yeah, no worries. Great. Thank you. Okay, so this will be the final call for public comment for items not on tonight's agenda. Okay, and our next speaker will be Matt Pruder. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, go right ahead. Thank you, Judy. Uh, good afternoon, council members. Mayor Wilson, council members and members of the public. My name is Matt Pruder. I'm an associate planner with the city of Menlo Park. You all hopefully know me pretty well. Just came not too long ago for a meeting. And I just like to briefly speak about our concerns with obviously the upcoming contract uh, situation and just the Matt, ongoing. I yes. do apologize for the interruption. We will be taking uh, public comment on our closed session at the uh, end of the meeting after a city council member reports that this is a comment related to closed sessions. I'm very sorry. Thank you for that. Oh, of course. Excuse me, um, City Clerk Heron? Yes. Um, we did take public comment on closed session items earlier. And if, if folks are on the line now, rather than having them have to wait till late tonight, um, I'm fine with accepting public comment on on closed session now, if, if that's permissible with the city attorney. Okay, thank you. All right, so we are currently taking uh, public comment for items not on tonight's agenda, which is item G. And then we're also taking public comment on our closed session items, N1, closed session conference with labor negotiators, as well as N2, conference with legal counsel regarding existing litigations. So if you are participating virtually and wish to speak on either the closed session or on general public comment, please engage that hand feature in the bottom of your screen. If you're calling in from a landline or a cell phone, please press star nine. If participating in person, you can complete a speaker card at that back table and return it to me. And I'm going to be returning to uh, Matt Pruder. So Matt, go right ahead. Thank you again, Judy, uh, appreciate it. Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, again, I guess just I'll start over. <laughs> Good evening, Mayor Wilson members of the 
Council and members of the public. Uh, he's not Pruder, Associate Planner with the Menlo Park Planning Division. And I just wanted to uh, just briefly talk about our uh, ongoing contract situation. And I'd like to just first express gratitude for the amount of work that's been put in. I know it's, it's a very serious and complicated effort, but we as staff definitely appreciate the consideration you're giving and definitely the opportunity to have our voices heard and understood. And, you know, we definitely value our job. We value the commitment we have to the city. And, you know, we, we just want to see a future where we're all, you know, working together for, for a better Menlo Park. And I think some of the items that have been discussed in discussions earlier and this, you know, ongoing closed session topics, um, I think speak to that. I think a lot of our concerns uh, have been, you know, brought forward. I don't want to necessarily uh, elaborate on that. I think a lot of that is understood, but I just would like to appreciate, you know, express my appreciation for the effort that's been done and, and just, you know, make it clear that we are very committed to the city. We're very committed to serving uh, you know, members of the public day in and day out. And uh, we appreciate that the work you're doing helping us you know, find a solution that, that works for our contract, for obviously our future and our families and our livelihoods. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you for your comment. So our next speaker will be listed as planning appointments, but if you could state your name for the record, that would be helpful and what item you are speaking on. Yes, good evening. Sorry about that. I forgot to change the name uh, on it. Uh, my name is Fatin Khan and I'm a uh, planner at the city of Menlo Park. And I wanted to talk about a uh, uh, comment on uh, the closed session item. Perfect. Thank you. Go right ahead. Good evening, council members. Thank you for allowing me time to speak this evening. I am a city employee, as mentioned, and wanted to talk about our concerns related to neighbor negotiations. But before I jump into that, um, as Matt expressed uh, his gratitude uh, for your considerations, we do appreciate the uh, hard work that everyone is doing with regards to this negotiation. We do take pride in our commitment to serving the city and its residents, but we did want to voice out our concern regarding the challenges that we're facing that impacts our ability to effectively and efficiently do our jobs, which has led to low worker morale. Uh, and this has been compounded by the high cost of living in Menlo Park, which is one of the most expensive areas to live in. Uh, and it has been a struggle for many of us, and we believe that we all deserve equity and fair wages, and this would also help uh, with retention in our city as it hurts our ability to provide quality services if we are not at full capacity. Uh, we are committed to our jobs and serving the city, so we would really appreciate uh, your consideration in the labor uh, negotiations. Uh, that we're all paid fairly and, uh, and you know, we all want to work here in the city of Menlo Park. So we would uh, want a continued uh, communication between council members and staff and um, make a good negotiation out of this. Uh, with that, I, I conclude my comments on this item. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. So our next speaker will be Sakni Sai. And Sakni, if you can let us know uh, the item you're commenting on. Good evening, Mayor Robeson, uh, Vice Mayor Taylor, and Council. As you know, my name is Sakni Sai, um, IT specialist too. I've been with the city for five and a half years. I'm a former Menlo Park resident. I used to reside over on Hollyburn, and I'm also a uh, former East Palo Alto resident. I currently reside in Stockton, California due to the high cost of living and uh, due to the high cost of living in Menlo Park and nearby cities. As a union member, I feel obligated to speak on behalf of the challenges Menlo Park employees are facing. I'd like to start off by saying that members 
Um, we've never been uh, united and then never before. Uh, we are at a 80% membership rate, and that is due to because we have concerns um, with regards to the negotiations that's taking place. And uh, we are united because we face ser ser uh, similar circumstances and problems. And we feel like now is not the time to sit idly and not have our voices heard. Um, with earlier comments, we're facing high inflation, high cost of living, you know, being on the lower end when it comes to being compensated per the comp study done by Sloan and Sakai comparing to nearby cities. And nevertheless, we are ready to continue to be partners to continue to keep the city running on full cylinders as we come to the negotiation table for a new contract. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your comment. And I did have a card for item N1 from John Sakat. Not sure if John is in the chambers or online or is planning on participating in the public comment period for closed session later on this evening. Okay, I have an additional hand raise. It is a phone number ending in 6723. You can please state your name for the record and which item you'd like to comment on. Hello, yes, this is John C. Cat. Perfect, thank you, John, go right ahead. Uh, hello, uh, council members. My name is John Seacat. I'm a California licensed professional engineer and I'm the full-time plan check engineer for Menlo Park. I started as a consultant back in 2018 and then hired on full-time in 2021. As a consultant, I had the experience of working at 10 other cities, but I chose to work here because I like the community and the city staff. Menlo Park's employees are professional, personable, and dedicated. Our dedication is on full display every day as we work to execute the priorities set by you, the council. One example is with electrification, where at least two of the council members here are enjoying the benefits of heat pump water heaters that I helped to permit. I'm only one of the many employees of the Community Development Department who were involved in that effort. And I believe that we provided quality service in those two permits, which we also do with the thousands of permits that we process every year. In order to accomplish that, uh, we have a talented staff, uh, a talented yet uh, understaffed uh, department of folks here who uh, love the city, and want to make it a better place. And uh, my comment basically is that uh, we, in order to attract more talent so that we can uh, do a much better job without uh, uh, being stressed with uh, uh, not having enough time in a day to, to provide service is something that's important and that we are uh, hoping to work with the city uh, in order to uh, continue uh, the level of service that the community is used to, uh, but with hopefully uh, a few more uh, heads and a few more talent uh, that we can uh, do with. I appreciate the opportunity and time afforded me in being able to comment on the union negotiations. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for your comment. All right, this will be the final call for public comment for item G, general public comment, item N1, closed session on labor negotiations, and closed session item N2, conference with legal counsel for existing litigation. If participating virtually, you can engage that hand feature or press star nine if, if calling in from a landline or a cell phone. If in person, you can complete a speaker card at that back table and return it to me at the clerk's desk. I'm seeing no further hands or cards. So Mayor Willison, you may continue. Thank you, City Clerk Karen, and thank you to everyone who gave a public comment this evening. Um, 
and it was nice hearing from our city staff um, this evening as well. Um, so as I mentioned, we are reordering um, item H, which is our next item, presentations and proclamations. We're gonna be doing our proclamations first, followed by our presentation. Um, so at this time, uh, we have five proclamations this evening. Um, City Clerk Karen, do we have any public comments on the proclamations this evening? Thank you, Mayor Willison. So at this time, if any member of the public would like to provide comment on item H2, a proclamation recognizing Public Works Week, item H3, a proclamation recognizing May 2023 as Mental Health Month, H4, a proclamation recognizing May 2023 as Bike Month, H5, proclamation for Jewish American Heritage Month, or H6, a proclamation for Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month. If you're participating virtually, please engage that hand feature in the bottom of your screen. Calling in from a landline or a cell phone, please press star nine. If participating in person, please complete a speaker card at the back table and return to me. This will be the final call for public comment on our proclamations, items F H2 through H6. And our first speaker will be Pam Jones. And Pam, if you can let us know which item you are speaking on. This is Pam Jones, and yeah, that, that, that is a challenge. Um, actually, it's H, I think it's H2, uh, yes, H2 on... Uh, uh, public works and I just I just want to say that I appreciate um that that the work that they're doing uh for this residents of the city and um uh, I know a proclamation is not money in your pocket but it is at least a way that we can another way we can say thank you thank you for your comment So our next speaker is John Butler, and this is on item H3. Hi, thank you for um, giving me this opportunity to speak uh, and uh, with respect, Honorable City Council, and I'm serious. I began this day speaking with the uh, San Mateo County Board of Supervisors, so it's a blessing to end this day speaking here in my hometown of Menlo Park. I've been a resident for 34 and a half years, approximately. Uh, I am uh, blessed with the assistance of the Housing Authority to be able to remain in my residence. I know it's a challenge for many of us, and uh, that's just clear, but um, I'm fortunate that I've had the right living situation. Uh, I came to Menlo Park following uh, my relationship that began with suicide in 1988. Um, uh, related to my mental health challenges has been uh, the um, detrimental use of alcohol and uh, my um, addiction to substances. So all of this has affected um, who I am today. And fortunately, I have lived and risen above all these things. And uh, mental health challenges has been a great part of why I became part of these lifestyles. And uh, many of us uh, in San Mateo County uh, are suffering today. Um, my purpose, my mission in life is to see that suffering ends to the best of my ability. Um, I have a passion for mental health and my spirituality is very important to me as well. Um, I believe uh, the most important thing for me is to uh, have resources and go into the community, the resource tables to invite the community into our mental health community. And Betsy has seen me in action slightly. So, um, uh, there's a lot to say in a limited time, but let me tell you that um, mental health uh, challenges are affect our souls. It begins with heartache and it, it, it continues with living a life of quiet desperation until we find hope. And I'm a person of hope. Uh, I'm recognized as a leader in my community because of the support of my community that I've risen up and I'm grateful for the opportunities to speak on mental health challenges that they do not have to endure forever in our lives. They can be overcome. And my responsibility, as I say, is my commitment to be sure that these things end in, in any way that I can. 
And I thank you for this proclamation. I thank you for recognizing all of us in our needs and our desires to get well. And I'm grateful again to be with you. And uh, good to see you, uh, Betsy, uh, Jen, and uh, Cecilia. And thank you for your constant uh, welcome, welcoming of me. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. So this will be the final call for public comment on our proclamations H2 through H6. Okay, and our next speaker will be Kathleen Daly. And Kathleen, if you can let us know which proclamation you're speaking on. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi. Um, every one of them is incredibly important, so I want to acknowledge all of them. Um, the first two, I think, are uh, super special public works. I would agree with um, a previous speaker, Pam Jones. Uh, those guys are great. Um, they're always there when we need them. So I'm super grateful for their work. And then the mental health challenges, having um, some family members and some personal situations with mental health challenges. Um, I applaud the speaker who just spoke regarding his stuff. And I just want to acknowledge the council and the city for recognizing that. But all the other three are great as well. So just a shout out to say thank you. Thank you for your comment. All right, seeing no further hands, oh, apologies. Uh, next speaker will be Katie Baruzzi. And Katie, if you can let us know which item you're speaking on. Um, hi, yes, thank you so much, uh, Katie Baruzzi. I serve on the Complete Streets Commission and I'm grateful every day for our fantastic Public Works staff. Um, I also appreciate all of these proclamations. Um, and so, um, and was tremendously moved by um, the previous speaker. Uh, but I do want to make a quick note today about, about Bike Month. Um, I wanted to applaud our city for signing up um, for the Bike to Wherever Challenge. I think we're still in the lead, which is really exciting. And I would also like to flag for our city that as we start to redevelop um, and develop uh, new exciting venues, restaurants, housing in our downtown specific plan area, um, that we should continue to keep bike accessibility and bike parking top of mind um, so that we truly can bike to wherever. Um, I am especially thinking of places like the Guild Theater, um, our new housing um, that's opening up uh, along uh, Middle Avenue and uh, some of the exciting new restaurants up closer to Oak Grove. So thank you all so much and look forward to working with you on uh, all of these projects. Thank you for your comment. All right, seeing no further hands or cards. Mayor Willison, you may continue. Thank you, City Clerk Karen, and thank you everybody um, for speaking on these proclamations. There are more proclamations that we could always be adding. It's it's challenging to figure out which ones to put on the agenda. I actually missed one last month. It was Autism Acceptance Month. So if they're for members of the public that have something um, that they want proclaimed, reach out. Um, if it fits, we'll, we'll get it in there because we really want to celebrate the diversity and um, issues that are important to our residents. So with that, um, we're going to reorder within this item even, um, I'm gonna come down. We have two in-person recipients of proclamations and we're gonna start with those. Those are H2, Public Works Week and H4, Bike Month. And then I will come back up to the dais and um, finish with the other ones. So um, again, give me a moment to get down there and we'll start with H2. All right, we are starting with H2, Recognizing Public Works Week. Whereas public works professionals focus on infrastructure, facilities, and services that are of vital, important, vital importance to sustainable and resilient communities and to the public health, high quality of life, and the well-being of the people of the city of Menlo Park. 
And whereas these infrastructure facilities and services could not be provided without the dedicated efforts of the public work professionals who are engineers, managers, and employees at all levels of government and the private sector. And whereas public works professionals are responsible for rebuilding, improving, and protecting our nation's transportation, water supply, water treatment, and solid waste systems, public buildings, and other structures and facilities essential for our citizens. And whereas it is in the public interest for the citizens, civic leaders, and children in the city of Menlo Park to gain knowledge of and to maintain an ongoing interest and understanding of the importance of public works and public works programs in their respective communities. And whereas the year 2023 marks the 63rd annual National Public Works Week sponsored by the American Public Works Association and Canadian Public Works Association. And now therefore be it proclaimed that I, Jen Wallison, mayor, do hereby designate, designate the week of May 21st to 27th, 2023 as National Public Works Week. I urge all citizens to join the representatives of the American Public Works Association and government agencies and activities, events, and ceremonies designed to pay tribute to our public works professionals, engineers, managers, and employees, and to recognize the substantial contributions they make to protecting our national health, safety, and quality of life. And I would like to introduce our administrative assistant, Maddie Godinez, to accept this proclamation. Hi, Maddie. And for those of you who are here for our CIP, we couldn't do any of that without our public works department. So thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, Maddie, Maddie, obligatory picture. Okay, I brought, just in case you weren't inspired by um, Ms. Baruzzi's comment about Bike Month, uh, we are in a competition with other cities to pledge the most riders for Bike to Wherever Month and Bike to Wherever Days that are coming up on the 18th, 19th, and 20th. All you have to do is pledge. It's free to pledge and get on your bike and we'll go to one of the five energizer stations that'll be set up in the city of Menlo Park. There's a map of where to find them. And you get this awesome tote bag. They're collector's items, and I really think everyone should come out so we can beat Gilroy. We are now in second place. So we got a, we some work to do, but we have a week, so let's get this done. So with that, we are going to recognize um, May 2023 as Bike Month. Whereas National Bike Month was established in 1956 to recognize the month of May as an annual recognition of bicycling as a convenient, fun, popular, and healthy form of transportation in the United States. And whereas the city of Menlo Park acknowledges that whether traveling to work, school, or simply running errands, bicycling is an integral commute mode in the multimodal transportation network, which alleviates traffic congestion, reduces air pollution, and decreases fuel consumption. And whereas bike to work, bike to school, and bike to wherever days have proven effective in promoting adults and children to bicycle and educating residents about the environmental importance and many benefits of biking to work, school, or wherever regularly, and whereas the city of Menlo Park encourages both its residents and visitors to bike in order to improve air quality, reap the health benefits of cycling, and to reduce overall traffic congestion. And whereas the city of Menlo Park Safe Routes to School program encourages children to bicycle and to walk to school to develop lifelong skills and independence. And whereas the city of Menlo Park has repeatedly demonstrated its commitment to vision zero and complete streets by actively working to build out its biking infrastructure to enable safer travel by people of all ages and abilities. And whereas the Bay Area will participate in the 12th annual National Bike to School Day on Wednesday, May 3rd, 2023, last week, and the 29th annual Bike to Work Wherever Day event on Thursday, May 18th, 2023, partnering with local bicycle coalitions, public school districts, private school private schools and nonprofit agencies and promoting a month long message that bicycling, bicycling is a fun, healthy and environmentally friendly, viable form of transportation. And now, therefore, be it proclaimed that I, Jen Wallison, mayor of the city of Menlo Park on behalf of the city council and city do hereby proclaim the month of May 2023 as bike month in the city of Menlo Park. And to accept this proclamation, I see both our chair and vice chair of our Complete Streets Commission, Sally Cole and Jackie Cibrian. Hello, ladies. 
All right. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Super excited. Judy. And then I know we're you need to get on with it, but it's a thing. Okay. Thank you, Mayor Wilson. <laughs> Thanks so Thank much. you. Uh, Google Silicon Valley Bike Coalition to figure out how to get. Okay, so our next proclamation is for May 2023 Mental Health Month. Whereas mental health conditions are among the most common health conditions and more than half the world's population will live with a mental health condition in their lifetime. And whereas in 2021, the US Surgeon General issued a health advisory on the youth mental health crisis that has been further exposed by the COVID-19 pandemic. And whereas one out of every 24 Californians with a serious mental health condition have difficulty functioning in everyday life, and if left untreated, have life expectations 25 years shorter than the general population. And whereas every day, millions of people face stigma related to mental health and substance use conditions and may feel isolated and alone, going years before receiving any help, and communities of color with mental health conditions are less likely to receive mental health services compared to their white counterparts. And whereas mental health and substance use conditions are treatable health conditions, and people who have mental health and substance use conditions can recover and lead full and meaningful lives. And whereas this year's May Mental Health Month theme, hashtag share for MH, encourages everyone to take actionable steps towards addressing mental health and substance use conditions, by sharing self-care and mental wellness practices and unpacking harmful stigma around mental health. And whereas in 2022, Menlo Park joined the San Mateo County Mayor's Mental Health Initiative, where mayors across the 20 cities in San Mateo County have come together with the mission of promoting awareness of and access to mental health resources in their communities. And whereas the Menlo Park City Council wishes to increase the public's knowledge of signs and symptoms of mental health and substance use conditions, professional and self-help resources and self-care practices. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed, I, Jen Wallison, Mayor of the City of Menlo Park, on behalf of the City Council and City, hereby recognize May 2023 as Mental Health Awareness Month to enhance public awareness of mental health, to help end the stigma and direct members of the community to resources and support for mental health and substance use conditions. And joining us virtually, we have Christy Liu, um, the co-chair of the San Mateo County May Mental Health Month Planning Committee and San Mateo County Behavioral Health and Recovery Services Office of Diversity and Equity um, is joining us virtually to accept this proclamation. Let's see, here she comes. Good evening. Hi, good evening. Good evening, everyone. Um, good evening, city mayor, uh, council members, city manager, and staff and residents of Menlo Park. My name is Christy Liu. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm a community program specialist for San Mateo County's Behavioral Health and Recovery Services Office of Diversity and Equity, and I'm also co-chair for San Mateo County's Men uh, May Mental Health Month. Um, yeah, just starting off by thanking Menlo Park for proclaiming May as Mental Health Month 2023. Um, it's so special when individual cities take the time to really recognize the importance of mental health and its impact on your communities. So May Mental Health Month is observed across San Mateo County, California, and the United States. Lime green is the national color for mental health and represents how we want to bring a bright light to see uh, to a bright light to an important issue that is normally hidden or seen as negative. Mental Health Month is one of the best times of the year where we reduce stigma, connect people to services, and promote wellness for mental health and substance use conditions. This year's statewide theme is share for mh We also use the hashtag share the number for mh and San Mateo County's Mental Health Month will feature a variety of virtual and in-person events, advocacy days, and a communication campaign. 
Our communication campaign is in English and Spanish, and events are in English, Spanish, and Cantonese. Mental Health Month is particularly very important to me because um, I'm because I believe mental wellness is a basic human right. And I'm sure we all have either been or know someone who has been negatively affected by mental health challenges. And I feel strongly about spreading the message that recovery is possible. So on my last note, I'm asking everyone in this room to starting today, take action on one of the one or more of the following options using the hashtag share for MH to spread the word about mental health month on social media wearing a lime green ribbon. This can either be worn physically on your clothes or virtually on your social media profile. And the hope is that this can help spark conversations about mental health. And lastly, attend a local Mental Health Month event. Um, Menlo Park Library hosts several amazing events throughout the month, um, a couple of which are library reads where you can meet with library staff to learn about uh, local mental health resources and connect with community. And they also have something called a special exhibition, a day in the life of recovery. Um, and I believe it's available for you to visit during all library hours um, as an art exhibition. For more support for the above options and more details on the free events and resources, you can visit our website at smchealth.org mhm. And just to end off with my note from the beginning, thank you so much to Menlo Park community for recognizing May as Mental Health Month. A lot of this is not achievable without all your help and we recognize your hard work. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Liu. We're very pleased to have you with us this evening to, to share this message. Um, so with that, we do have two more proclamations. Um, I will be reading summaries of them, not the full proclamations, and we don't have anyone accepting these proclamations. Um, so the first one is H5, Jewish American Heritage Month. This national observance was established in 2006 to recognize the unique history and culture of the Jewish American community. During May 2023, hundreds of organizations and Americans of all backgrounds are joining together to discover, explore, and celebrate the vibrant and varied American Jewish experience from the dawn of our nation to the present day. Celebrating Jewish American Heritage Month helps to strengthen our communities and promote a sense of belonging, shared civic life, and deeper understanding of our cultural heritage. Celebrate Jewish American Heritage Month and honor the incredible contributions that Jewish Americans have made to our culture. And I have been asked on this item to read uh, one particular thing, which is from the Holocaust Remembrance Alliance. And it's a definition of anti-Semitism, given um, some of the things going on in our, in our country and our communities. Anti-Semitism is a certain perception of Jews which may be expressed as hatred toward Jews. Rhetorical and physical manifestations of anti-Semitism are directed towards Jewish or non-Jewish individuals and or their property towards Jewish community institutions and religious facilities. So thank you for bearing with me while I read that. Um, our final proclamation is H6, Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month. May is AAPI Heritage Month honoring the contributions of Asian American and Pacific Islanders to our history, society, and culture. Since 1979, May has been a dedicated time to celebrate Asian Pacific American heritage, but it wasn't until 1992 that May was officially designated Asian Pacific American Heritage Month. This year's theme is a seat at the table, which highlights the AAPI community's advancements and achievements and calls for their continued equity and inclusion in society. The theme also highlights the importance of family gatherings and sharing meals in Asian and Pacific Islander cultures. So those are the proclamations this evening. Um, I wanted to see if my colleagues wanted to add anything on them. Okay, well, um, I know that uh, took some time, but we appreciate um, having the opportunity to recognize um, some important themes in our community to make sure all feel welcome and included. Um, as I mentioned, we were reordering our proclamations and presentations this evening. And with that, we are moving on to H1, which is our much anticipated uh, presentation, which I know we have a lot of people excited to hear this. It's UC Berkeley students regarding affordable housing opportunities on the city-owned parking plazas in downtown. 
And um, I'd actually like to give a, a quick intro on this item. Um, I had the opportunity to meet with these grad students um, early in their semester where they came to speak to our staff members about a school project. It sounds like a little school project, but this is like a grad school uh, at an elite institution project um, where they had an assignment to develop affordable housing projects on publicly owned land. They identified two cities um, to do this uh, project. One was the city of Menlo Park's downtown parking lots and one was Piedmont. Um, so they came to learn about our downtown parking lots. They were asking amazing questions of our city staff, like where are the utility lines buried? Um, what's the density? What's the community feel? Um, all kinds of questions. And then they went and, and did their work. And um, last week they had their final presentations at UC Berkeley. And all of the various teams, there were some teams that presented on the Piedmont projects, and then there were three teams that presented on the Menlo Park parking lots, and all three teams did an excellent job. Um, I think it's really exciting, given that we're going to be having community conversations about our downtown specific plan. We have a uh, program in our submitted and adopted housing element to create affordable housing on our downtown parking lots. And uh, we're gonna be really diving into this topic as a community as the year unfolds. So I'm very thrilled that we have some folks that have already started inspiring us with their ideas to kind of kick off the conversation. I wanna note that these are student presentations. So what you're gonna to see tonight um, likely will not be built exactly <laughs> in our downtown parking lots, but I hope it gives us a lot to think about as we move forward in these community conversations. So. With that, I would like to introduce Andrew Wofford um, to have him uh, let us know what we're going to hear. Hi, Andrew. It's good to see you again. Hi, Mayor Wilson. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Andrew Wofford. Uh, I'm a first year master's of city planning student at UC Berkeley, focusing on housing, community, and economic development. Um, and as Mayor Wilson mentioned, we're a part of an affordable housing studio. Um, uh, and all very honored to present our uh, findings and presentations uh, tonight. Um, you're gonna hear from two groups. The first is via Zoom, uh, and the second is with you all in person. Um, and lastly, just wanna say thank you very much for the Go Bears shout out. I know there are Stanford alums in the chambers tonight, so we extra appreciate it. Um, okay, uh, I think our uh, Chiara, Cecilia, and Ruchi, are you on? Ruchi's um, trying to get in. Um, maybe, I don't know if you can see on the other end if she, Ruchi's in the waiting room. I don't know how it works. Uh, City Clerk Karen, I think there's someone in the waiting room that could be promoted. Yes. It's just waiting for them to accept. Okay, thank you. Okay. Let's see. I'll let her know. Sorry about that. Um, in the meantime, I can give just a little bit more background on the studio itself. Um, this is the James Boyce Affordable Housing Studio, um, taught by Ben Metcalf, former director of uh, HCD, Claire Paris of Redstone Equity Partners, Tomas McKay of McKay Architecture, and Daniel Simons of David Baker Architects. Um, and just so you have a, a slightly better sense of what we were doing, uh, we had the chance to meet with a ton of industry professionals, starting with obviously um, city staff and elected officials, which was a great opportunity, but sort of simulating the process of how to think about design development of affordable housing. Uh, and each year, different cities and sites are selected. And we are a teaching team wanted to focus on cities that were um, admirably trying to build affordable housing, a, a lot of affordable housing in conjunction with the housing element process. Um, okay, Ruchi, glad we have you on. Uh, yes. I'm gonna share my screen and we'll start with our first presentation, which is Menlo Crossing. Awesome. Um, Judy, is that coming through? Yes, looks good, Andrew, thank you. Perfect, okay. Um, so again, my name is Andrew, joined by Chiara, Ruchi, and Cecilia. Um, we're very excited and honored to present our, uh, our presentation, Menlo Crossing. Uh, first, I want to give you a quick roadmap for what we're going to cover. Ruchi and I will discuss our project mission, 
uh, along with our phasing and financing strategy. And then we'll pass it over to Kiara and Cecilia, uh, who were our architects that worked on our master plan and design concept. Um, starting off, I want to give you a sense of how we sort of shaped our proposal. We had a really helpful meeting early on uh, with uh, city council members and staff, and we emerged from that conversation with very clear understanding of what the city needed to accomplish in this process, which were obviously a lot of affordable homes downtown, replacing existing parking, and then reactivating the downtown business district, uh, especially in the wake of COVID. Um, then we looked at census data and found some disconcerting statistics. Um, over a quarter of all large family households and over three quarters of all low income seniors in Menlo Park are cost burdened or severely cost burdened. Uh, that really confirm what we had heard from the city and what we saw in the housing element, which is that increasingly families are moving out of Menlo Park as they grow larger and seniors are at serious risk of displacement. Um, so we really chose to prioritize these two communities and that led us to our project mission, which is to create an affordable, sustainable and multi-generational development where growing families can make Menlo Park their long-term home and senior citizens can age in a safe, walkable and interconnected community. So how, uh, so how do we create that community on the site plan? Uh, basically, we are proposing development in three phases. Next slide, please. Phase one, which is going to produce 155 affordable homes by July 2028. Excuse me, Rushi. Can you Phase please- Excuse me, Rushi. Can you please orient uh, members of the public on the map and where they're looking at, please? Oh, yes, for sure. So uh, can you just go back, Andrew? Mm -hmm. uh, this slide, Ruchi, or the one before? The one before. So basically, I would just like to highlight that these are the eight parcels the lower five parcels uh will be the last phase which i'll be just uh sharing with you all the upper two parcels three parcels parcel one two and three all of them are the other phase one and two which again i'm going to share how we are going to build on these eight parcels uh and how we are going to create a community on this side plan uh and your next slide please mm -hmm. This is parcel one, which is a phase one, will, which will produce 155 affordable homes by July 2028. Uh, next slide, please. This is phase two, parcel two and parcel three, which is going to produce 145 affordable homes by February 2030. Along with this, we are proposing a 298 stall parking garage early in the development timeline on the middle parcel which is the surface parking in order to minimize disruption to the small business owners located on the lower side of the five parcels. These first two phases is, are going to produce 300 homes serving 30 to 60% AMI households. Next slide, please. This is going to be the phase three, the lower side five parcels. And based on a feasibility study, we have split these five parcels into two sub phases, phase 3A and 3B. Phase 3A will create two affordable senior developments, producing a total of 65 one bedroom homes and 50 surface parking. Both developments have a ground floor space that will provide youth programs. Next, please. Last is the phase 3B. To make it a financially feasible project, we are proposing 34 for sale townhomes on these parcels, which will help meet growing demand for home ownership in Menlo Park. And second, cross subsidize the development of a parking garage and farmer's market. Uh, the parcel six, the middle parcel on the lower side, which you can see, is presently home to the weekly farmer's market. And we are proposing that it will continue to serve the same purpose because it's an important community space. As part of a community engagement strategy, I went and met with the vendors of the organizers of the market, uh, Laurie Henning, and she expressed their desire for permanent shaded stalls for which we are proposing 75 solar carports. This farmer's market 
market will also create a win-win situation by introducing food stamp program for low and middle income communities. Uh, next, please. In summary, this table shows the unit and parking we will be creating on all these eight parcels. We are going to propose 365 affordable homes and 34 townhomes for a total of 399 housing units and 966 replacement parking spots plus 234 parking spots for residents and staff for a total of 1,200 parking spaces. So obviously one of the big challenges of working on city owned uh, parking lots that serve businesses is how do we replace that parking? And so uh, the numbers that Ruchi just showed you mean that we are replacing 80% of the existing parking downtown and also providing half a space per unit uh, for each new uh, unit of housing that we create on the sites, um, which we feel is a, a strong ratio. Um, that is attainable by October 2031 based on our uh, due diligence and financial feasibility analysis. Um, this is an overview of our development timeline, very zoomed out. Uh, but we sort of acknowledged early on that conditions often shift, especially market conditions as we're seeing all the time. Uh, and also the needs of residents and consumers might shift within Menlo Park over the course of such a long period of time. So we decided to build in uh, optionality for the city. So as you can see, in February 2030, we're proposing to conclude phase two, uh, which we hope will produce uh, a parking garage uh, up on parcel two, the top of the site. Um, that garage we're proposing to charge for parking, for parking that was previously free, and that can often lower demand. So we are strongly encouraging that the city conduct a thorough parking study in 2030 to determine if demand has lowered. If it has, then we have an alternative proposal for phase three. Um, so just to orient you, uh, in sort of our initial proposal, we had imagined a second garage on parcel eight, uh, along with some for sale townhomes on parcel five. Instead, in this alternative option, we're sort of giving the city the pathway to say, maybe we can create more affordable housing for seniors or families. And then without the need to cross subsidize a second garage, the city could reconsider a fully market rate development on parcel five and instead maybe consider below market rate housing, um, particularly for affordable home ownership. I know the city has an existing program that's been quite successful at producing um, below market rate uh, home ownership units. Um, generally speaking, we just think with such a long time horizon, the unpredict unpredictability uh, of developing this site represents a major challenge for the city. So we see this optionality as a potential strength. Um, oops, pardon me. I'm gonna pass it over to Ruchi, who just will give you a quick snapshot of uh, how we're proposing to finance the project. So basically pro uh, with a project of this scale, we thought very strategically, not just about the timeline, but also about the financing structure for each phase. What I want to focus on are the funding sources that allowed us to create a sustainable development, ASIC in phase one, and a peninsula EV and solar tax credits in phase 3B. With the help of our consultant, Sally Greenberg at Enterprise Community Partners, we will be incorporating ASIC as a key component in fulfilling the city's long-held vision for a sustainable and resilient streetscape. In line with this vision, we are going to pursue a net zero approach through five different strategies. One will be the mass timber construction, then urban green space with preservation and addition of the street trees, which I sure is very important for the city. Capital investment in SAM trains and Cal trains for which we are going to purchase three electric train cars, uh, solar carports, and lastly, enhanced bikeable and walkable streetscape by providing mobility, access and safety improvements. These improvements are crucial to our urban design philosophy as well, which Cecilia is going to speak to now. Okay, so the city of Menlo Park wants to reactivate its downtown, particularly after the pandemic. Using our ASIC funding, we take the opportunity to expand both the pedestrian sidewalks and bicycle lanes to bring people outside into the public space and local businesses. Uh, the first image highlights the pedestrian sidewalks, crosswalks, and connection. Um, Andrew, you can go back. <laughs> um, 
So this is like the highlight in beige. As you can see, Santa Cruz Avenue is already showing signs of pedestrian expansion throughout its temporary parklets and frequent crosswalks. In the parcels below Santa Cruz, we are expanding a par parallel pedestrianized road, which we named Mallow Promenade. Next slide. Here in red is the existing bike lane. Um, as you can see, it is not connected to the rest of the downtown area. Uh, we identified a need to expand this existing bike lane. So first, this is the proposed bike lane expansion within our developments. It includes bike lanes and bike parking. We hope that this could be a catalyst for this other vision. Next slide, which unifies the eight lots, creating a network of active circulation to increase the permeability and viability of downtown Menlo Park. As you suggested, it is um, the bike month, so that would be a great improvement. But <laughs> next slide. So programmatically, we agreed that the two largest parcels should be allocated for the multifamily housing in order to maximize the unit counts. So the upper two parcel. Instead, we located the senior housing on the lower sites because they were close to the services like grocery store and the farmer's market that Rich mentioned before. So to bring these two communities together, especially kids and seniors, and to create an intergenerational community, we located a child care center and after school program on the ground floor of the senior developments, hoping not only to connect with young families, but also incentivizing spaces for casual encounters, knowledge, knowledge exchanges, and vibrant and active outdoor circulation. As the farmer market has been providing every Sunday to the population of Menlo Park. On a design level, next slide. Um, on a design level, we decided to reflect this connection concept by connecting all the eight lots throughout a system, which Kara will explain its nature on our design. That's great. Um, yes, today I'm excited to walk you through Treehouse North, which is the first phase of um, our proposal here. And just to remind you, it is a large multifamily housing project that will take place on one of the larger parcels above um, Santa Cruz Avenue. So let's get started. Our design goals um, for this process are listed here. First is the idea of modularity because we wanna make the construction process more efficient. The second is to achieve dynamic shared spaces. We wanna make our community spaces within this project exciting and engaging. And lastly, our goal is to support a green and biophilic environment which um, this goal led to the choice of our building structure, which um, as Ruchi said, will be made from mass timber. So in this process, um, because we're thinking of mass timber, we started off by setting up a 12 by 12 grid of mass timber columns. And then with this concept, we began to lay out one, two, and three bedroom unit types. And within these three options, we began to think about how we could interlock the units and stack plumbing walls to create a more efficient system. Next slide. Um, mass timber also is great because it allows us to achieve a desired height of 60 feet without the need of a concrete podium, which because we are in interested in sustainability and having this more um, green approach, this is a really important feature of our project. And additionally, this mass timber structure, we began to be able to design this trellis system that could be on the exterior of the building that would provide vegetation to the housing units as well as shading because they are in the middle of an infill light site. So thinking about shading and how we can incorporate green space was super important to this project. Next. Um, Moving on into the interior, the yellow here is calling out the community spaces in our building. The plan on the bottom is showing um, the community spaces. And as you can see, they're more situated toward the entrances. So these would be the lobbies and offices and any sort of kind of utilitarian um, services. But then as we look in the section drawing at the top, we start to see there's yellow also kind of in the middle of the building. And this was a design goal of ours because this idea of incorporating community spaces within the building creates very interesting and dynamic 
fun spaces for the community. So if you go to the next slide, this is kind of one of those moments um, that the community space is kind of suspended in the middle of the building. You can see the doors, the units on the sides, and we have this grand staircase that people can engage with and you know gather in the middle of the building where um, above there's daylight. So um, yeah, it's the air here is visible. So you can imagine that the air would be um, light and fresh and these daylit platforms are reached via a shifting staircase, which offers these really nice vantage points into treetops below and then just the community engaging. And at the same time, behind each of these colorful doors that lead into the units, there is a home that is quiet and welcoming and ready to support the lives of the dwellers that can live in this project. And we truly believe that there is a home for everyone here in this treehouse. Thank you very much. You're on mute, Andrew. Thank you. <laughs> My apologies. Thanks for bearing with us with the technical difficulties. Um, just to briefly close, uh, returning to these goals that we left the city with uh, many months ago, um, we ended up proposing 365 homes on top of the, the goal of 345. Um, we replaced 80% of the city's downtown parking, not exactly 100. Um, and then we sort of envisioned this treatment, pedestrian treatment, the Menlo Promenade that would bring people out to create community outside, but also to shop at local businesses. Uh, and then on top of that, we're very proud of a vision of a sustainable future for the city, really moving people towards active transportation and public transportation. Um, this vision of optionality that gives some flexibility to the city to maybe create more housing rather than parking if needs shift and then a multi-generational program. Seniors and young people are often quite isolated in traditional affordable development. So we're quite proud of uh, our programmatic design kind of weaving those two populations together. Um, so in the end, we, uh, we feel we've crafted a proposal that uh, hopefully met our vision. And we're again, very honored that we got the chance to share it with you all um, and really grateful uh, to city staff and, and uh, Mayor Wallison and council member Council member, council member door, pardon me, um, for meeting with us way back when. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you so much, Menlo Crossing. Um, really appreciate how much thought you put into this and um, gave us a lot to think about. Um, so I think what we're going to do is we're going to hear the second presentation, then we're going to open it up to public comment. So you might want to stay on the line and hear if folks have comments and then um, some brief council questions or comments, but um, we're not gonna dive too much into discussion on this um, tonight, but like I said, you have given us a lot to think about. So with that, um, I'm not quite sure who to introduce now, but I know we have some folks in chambers. Um, so I would invite you to come up and it's exciting to see you again. And I'll ask Andrew and Cecilia, go ahead, disengage your webcams. Thank you. And the team, no offense to Menlo Crossing and no pressure on you guys, but this team did win, I believe, the, um, it was a bit of a competition, the different presentations. So they were all fabulous, but um, now I've set everyone's expectations very high. So I apologize, um, but we'll appreciate whatever you have to show us. Thank you. Thanks. Can everybody hear me? Okay, great. Um, well, welcome. Thank you for coming. Um, today, we're going to walk you through our plans for downtown Menlo Park's master plan. Um, me. Could you put the mic a little bit closer? Closer? Yeah. How's that? Great. Thank yeah? you. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, so our plan, we're calling it the new medium. And yeah, follow along. Uh, we're calling ourselves PAD. Um, my name is Kate. I'm a planner. This is Jono and this is Sophie. They're both architects. 
Um, and our um, real estate master student, Rena, could not be here today. So I will be speaking a lot covering her. <laughs> um, so our mission for this project uh, is to cultivate a vibrant downtown that is primarily three things. Uh, first, mixed income, so supporting a variety of affordability levels with an emphasis on the lowest incomes. Um, second, multi-generational, so bringing together people of all ages. And third, medium rise, high density, which I'll pass over to Sophie to explain. So the foundation of our design is high density at a medium scale. Um, when we first looked at these sites, we wanted to really maintain the neighborhood feel of Menlo Park while still building densely at a low cost since it is affordable housing. Um, so instead of large buildings, we developed smaller typologies that could use wood frame slab on grade construction, which is cheaper than concrete podiums. Um, and we decided to cluster these buildings around outdoor space um, to facilitate more light and airflow and more community gathering spaces outdoors. Um, this sort of allows us to maintain that neighborhood feel um, and also achieve more uh, interesting spaces to live in for the future residents that and still respect the, um, the existing context of Menlo Park as it stands now. Um, so as you know, the, um, the city has eight city-owned uh, parking lots that are up for redevelopment. And so we have to plan at the scale of master planning, and we're doing that in multiple phases. Um, our first phase, uh, which we're calling our pilot phase, so gradually introducing the community to our project, um, we chose the least intrusive lot uh, of the eight lots. It is the least utilized of the city-owned parking lots. Um, it's a larger site close to the edge of downtown, and it does not require infrastructure improvements. Uh, as you might know, the sites um, along the south of Santa Cruz Ave uh, with all the businesses need those. Um, so this first site will be 91 units of 100% affordable housing. Um, it'll be, have a focus on large family units and be completed in 2028. Our second phase is a joint phase, uh, creating 64 townhomes. Uh, and a public garage. Uh, the public garage is conveniently located closer towards El Camino Real and the Caltrain station. Um, and the townhomes are on the second largest lot. Uh, 48 of them will be market rate and 16 will be below market rate. So um, at moderate income, like 100, 120% AMI. Um, and the funds from the market rate units will be used to fully subsidize the public garage by 2030. Um, our next two phases are, um, are hybrids. So that's like a fancy term for applying for a 4% tax credit deal and a 9% tax credit deal at the same time to speed along the development timeline. Um, and we chose the smaller lots for the senior projects and the larger lots for the large family projects. So this one is, we split up 60 units and 90 units. Um, and that's the same for the fourth phase, which will be completed by 2034. Another important aspect to our project is an urban greenway. Um, we put this right behind all of the, um, the businesses along Santa Cruz Ave. Um, since most people are parking and going into the businesses from the back anyway, uh, we figured that we would activate that space even more, uh, offer a pedestrian only walkway that has more green space, uh, a place for the farmer's market, um, and economically stimulate uh, the, the area. Um, so just to give an overview of our master plan, um, the residents that we're looking to serve are large families, seniors, veterans, people with special needs, and moderate income families. Um, in total, we're, we're going to provide a 453 housing units. 400 of those will be affordable. Uh, at an average uh, area median income of 49%, which is considered very low income. Um, we have a very high density of 150 dwelling units per acre, and we'll be providing 608 public parking spots with a replacement parking ratio of 0 0.7 to 1. Um, and I know that the city has mentioned in the past that, um, that you all are interested in full replacement parking. So I wanted to address that in our presentation. Um, uh, keep in mind that our this ratio of 0 0.7 to 1 is just for the public parking that's going to be replaced on the lots. And all of our residents have their own separate parking 
and they'll have a ratio of 0.8 spaces per unit. Um, and according to our own financial analysis, um, we don't think that it would be possible to provide um, more, um, more parking for more than five stories of our public parking garage. Um, but ultimately we see the future of downtown Menlo Park as more walkable, pedestrian oriented and less car oriented. So this is kind of looking forward to that vision. Um, in terms of community benefits, so not just uh, benefits for the residents, but the entire community of Menlo Park, we're providing an early childcare center, a senior community center, uh, Urban Greenway, as I mentioned, with a public plaza, um, public art partnerships, uh, and of course the public parking garage. Uh, more details on this can be found in our narrative if you're curious. Um, yeah. Okay, so now that we have um, the master planning out of the way, we can dive into phase one of our project, um, which sort of will be the focus of the remainder of the presentation and is quite exemplary of our design philosophy. So phase one has 91 units um, equally split between unit types, and these units are located in six buildings. Um, I would say the hallmark of our design philosophy is that we use single stair egress, which we'll dive into later to explain. And what this does is it pushes all of the corridors outside of the building, meaning that we're able to intentionally use circulatory space um, as public outdoor space for people to enjoy. Um, and again, we'll be covering this. Um, but to shift focus a little bit, we spent a lot of time as architects going through sort of the difference, balancing the, um, the general design concept with the daily life of our design. And we really feel that it's necessary to illustrate that to you guys today. So what we've done is we've provided two resident stories that we're going to walk you through now. Um, and while we walk you through these, pay attention to the role that public space um, and dynamic interiors play in their daily lives. Okay. So Charlie is 10 and lives in Menlo Park with her mother. After school, the bus drops her off on University Drive. She makes her way home through an intimate outdoor pathway. She waves to her neighbors who are cooking in their kitchens and sitting on their front patios as she passes. The compression of this pathway expands into a spacious central courtyard. She spots a friend to play with while she waits for her mother, Nina, to return home from work. Nina used to commute from Hayward to work at Menlo Medical Clinic. Now that she lives in Menlo Park, Nina is able to spend much more time with her daughter. In the evenings, she chats with neighbors and attends online classes on her patio while Charlie enjoys the outdoors. After eating dinner and doing homework together, the pair go up the spiral staircase for a bedtime story as the sun set, sets behind the trees. Rodney wakes up early Sunday morning to meet his grandkids at the Menlo Park Farmer's Market on the new Greenway. While there, they shop for a healthy meal. Returning to his building, they wait in the central atrium for the elevator up to the roof. While there, the trio take in views of downtown Menlo Park in the courtyard below. They wave to neighbors across the way as they pick herbs to complete their recipe. Back in Rodney's apartment, he prepares lunch. Before moving here, Rodney couldn't see his family much because of a disability. But since moving to Menlo Park, he's been able to enjoy his older age by spending time with his grandchildren outdoors. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the architectural decisions that go into making these lifestyles possible. So on the left is an example of a typical double loaded corridor building with our medium typology on the right. By removing corridors altogether, we're able to build less and reduce cost. So the cost difference between that double loaded corridor and our medium typology is $11 million. That also allows us to give more outdoor space to um, residents instead of concentrating all that corridor space inside the building. Um, so we hope to create more dynamic exterior spaces and higher quality um, interior spaces where people actually live. And I would also like to mention that a single stair as opposed to a double loaded corridor has benefits for daily life as well. As you can see from this diagram, for an individual unit, a double loaded corridor does not allow multiple exposures to light, air, and the outdoors. And it's also quite inefficient in terms of the amount of the building it occupies. Instead, by arranging these units around a single stair, we're able to give all these living spaces multiple exposures, so more sunlight and air 
um, on multiple walls and all those um, units. And we're also able to make smaller buildings. So let's talk a little bit about what is making the use of one stair possible, um, which of course, one stair is not typical. I, I would argue that we would all be building with one stair if our building codes were different. But um, this brings me exactly to our point, which is there is a bill in state assembly right now called AB 835, which was proposed by assembly member Alex Lee from San Jose. And this would allow for one means of egress in residential construction in California. Um, you can see from the plan above how we chose to organize units around a single stair and a central atrium. Each unit has multiple exposures to the outdoors and um, ample access to light and air. Uh, this is how the scheme works in section. As you can see, this section used to be a parking lot with the existing buildings on the right and left, but the mid-rise of our typologies fits with this existing typology and provides the density. And I think this brings me to the main point that we'd like to illustrate with the presentation is that Menlo Park sort of is in an interesting situation where their existing typology is quite low density, but um, they're interested in investigating higher density through affordable housing. And you can really get the best of both worlds by using a single stair egress system. And this is why we would like to put forth advocacy for the bill CA AB 835. And if, of course, we can answer more questions later. Um, okay, so as you can see, we are really enthusiastic about AB 835. We actually have a QR code in the back there. Um, you can sign our petition. To We're going to send a letter of support um, to Alex Lee to continue advocating for that. Um, and yeah, we think that with these sites, Menlo Park is in a position to become a great advocate for single stair reform and to become a leader in the changing landscape of California housing. It's going to change a lot. Um, hopefully soon. And I think by positioning yourselves in sort of at the front of that and advocating for single stair, I, I think you can only win with that. So um, I'll let Kate talk a little bit more about our financial details now. Um, so just to dive uh, not too deep in the finance, because you can get it in the narrative. So I'll just give you the main highlights. Yeah. Uh, this will be the whole entire master plan. Uh, all four phases are going to be $492 million. Um, and as you can see, it gets progressively more expensive. Note that in um, phase one, there's uh, one development that we have. Um, phase two, three, and four each have two developments associated with them. Um, and that brings us at $790,000 uh, for each door. Um, and again, I'll just go into the, the highlights for each of our um, phases. Um, for phase one, uh, we notably are applying for um, a state grant uh, that's competitive called the Multifamily Housing uh, Program. Um, so we also analyzed a separate state grant, uh, the Affordable Housing Sustainable Communities Fund, um, I believe it's called, uh, as a backup. Uh, and we also are applying for solar tax credits because our projects uh, meet our sustainability goals. For this phase one project, uh, we'll be providing family-friendly amenities. Like, as you can see, there's this nice water feature that the architects developed, <laughs> uh, resident services, uh, case manager um, for our um, residents with special needs and such. Uh, for phase two, um, as I mentioned earlier, the um, we're having a joint development with the townhomes and the parking garage. Um, so the the parking garage will be five stories of public parking, um, and 43% of that will be uh, debt from uh, that will be paid for with um, parking fees and whatnot from the garage, and 57% will be from contributed directly from the sales of the townhomes. Uh, for phase three and four, again, we had a hybrid deal structure to shorten our timeline. Um, and here is where we're providing a lot of the uh, amenities for the wider community. So the senior center, um, veteran services, we know that the um, there was a recent affordable housing project for veterans um, that was completed um, that we would ask a lot of the same uh, services for. An early child care center, we know there's a huge need for um, affordable child care in the area, case managers, and potentially shuttles to the newly um, about to be completed Menlo Park Community Campus. So these were just some of our ideas uh, that we had for later phases. Uh, so just to recap, 
what makes the new medium at Menlo exceptional? Well, remember our three M's, we are mixed income, multi-generational, and medium rise, high density. All of our developments are also efficiently built in terms of cost, sustainability, design. Um, and lastly, we're providing quality living space, uh, providing light and air indoors, and also lots of green space outdoors. Um, I also wanted to mention that I totally forgot that um, in the last, uh, we did not develop the final lot uh, on Draeger's, uh, or in front of Draeger's because we, we thought that it would be too burdensome for people to drag their groceries across a few blocks. So we did only develop seven of the lots. Yeah, um, that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, the new medium, pad. Yeah. <laughs> um, for your presentation. Um, so if you wanna take a seat for a moment, I'm going to be calling for public comment. Then I'm going to allow council members to ask questions or discuss briefly. And then we'll be taking a short break and members of the public can come up and see this incredible model that the students built. It's our town's downtown to scale. Um, and the little projects lift up so that they you could exchange each of the three presentations with different options. So it's you have to check it out. Um, so with that, um, City Clerk Karen, can you please call for public comment? Yes, thank you, Mayor Willison. So at this time, if any member of the public wishes to provide comment on item H1 presentation, UC Berkeley students regarding affordable housing opportunities on the city owned parking plazas in downtown. If you are participating virtually, please engage that hand feature in the bottom of your screen. If you're calling in from a landline or a cell phone, please press star nine. If participating in person, please complete a speaker card at that back table and return it to me at the clerk's desk. And our first speaker will be Adina Levin, followed by Simon Henson. Hello, good evening, Mayor, City Council members, uh, staff, and uh, honored guests um, from UC Berkeley who have put together this really uh, thought-provoking and inspiring set of presentations. Um, I am a, a Menlo Park resident. I live uh, close walking distance from downtown and I'm also part of Menlo Together, which is a nonprofit that focuses on affordable housing and um, sustainability in Menlo Park. And having um, ha uh, more housing, uh, including affordable housing in our downtown area was really one of the first things that um, inspired us as Menlo Together, seeing that the downtown area is so uh, walkable and rich in services and um, close to public transportation. It's really just a fantastic place for more housing, um, as is being called out in our housing element and uh, where the city is really expecting in the coming year to be, uh, you know, doing the planning. So it's really great to have the creative thoughts of students to help inspire us as a city as we head down this path of, of figuring out what kinds of uh, homes to provide. Um, having those downtown parking lots um, really um, with, the, with the public land um, allows the deeply affordable housing. Um, and um, in the inspiration in these presentations, it was really exciting to see the vision of the um, diversity of people across ages and family sizes and types. Um, loved the uh, uh, vision of the child care with the senior center. So you have a built-in bubby abuela or auntie. Um, the uh, uh, vision of the um, uh, public spaces and active transportation. Um, loved thinking about construction types that can allow lower cost construction that can enable um, more affordable housing um, with less funding. Uh, wanted to make some comments about some of the um, transportation um, inspiration here. Um, we have a a uh, little bit of a cautionary tale um, with the Springline development, which has huge amount of parking that is currently it deeply underutilized. 
which um, you know some residents were concerned it would be underutilized and it really is. So I think that we need to be really looking at how much parking we need um, as well as uh, programs to help new residents and you know existing workers and residents to drive less to be able to use our space um, for uh, 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 many purposes, including housing and right size, the parking. Thank you so much um, for this inspiration as we head down this path. Thank you for your comment. Our next speaker will be Simon Henson, followed by Jenny Michelle. Hello? Yes, go right ahead. Perfect. I'd like to comment on H1. Um, I found the presentation by the UC Berkeley students deeply inspiring. And I'm really curious to know if there'll be opportunities to enact these just mind blowing envisions. So if you could find a way to uh, show these presentations online or have the actual models uh, in downtown, that would be very wonderful for our students to see, for our kids to see, just for the future of this town. Thank you so much. Thank you for your comment. So next up is Jenny Michelle, followed by Karen Grove. Um, dear Mayor, Vice Mayor, City Council members, neighbors, members of the public, my name is Jenny Michelle from the Common Place Neighborhood Block, longtime renter on Willow Road, mom of IEP student, recovering homeless teacher, childhood sexual assault survivor, by trade, a commercial property manager, City Clerk Judy fan club member and bringing you bad news tales from the Leverage Labor Crypt. This is such a fantastic project. Really well done from an asset management and facilities management perspective. I literally cannot express my enthusiasm more for your work. Yes! For the record, game on. Stanford needs to step up our collective game here. Where are our programs to compete and create a vibrant urban planning educational department, right? Berkeley is crushing us and we are getting defeated in the best way possible. Oh my God. This is the future, allowing the approach to incorporate all notes that a building will need to withstand for the next 50 years. Our buildings age differently now and the assumptions for what buildings, land and people will experience and load carry is devastatingly scary. We need to adjust and we need to scale. This project allows for those assumptions to stabilize the assets long term. Expletive, yes! I wholly support this project and I'm not bashful about my enthusiasm, obviously. Unfortunately, because of my experience as it relates to the environmental justice element, my concern is that we are not mirroring the same zoning densities as District 1, if not to create further density because of the close proximity to transit and resource rich areas as the downtown area. We need to infill density relative to Redwood City as we scale the impact to climate on a per basis uh, per unit basis decreases. Our massive SFRs are driving climate instability. Ugh. We need to get creative like taxing Atherton residents and our municipality as a whole in a like an in lieu tax fee where they are if they're unable to build for and support the varieties of labor force that they're in demand for and employ on a per capita basis, they burden us with their infrastructure needs. So we need to subsidize them for the proper load that they impose upon us. Does that make sense? Why not pay workers to bike to work as other cities do on a per mile basis with a cap per month? My last concern is having to do with the Safeway parking lot. It looks like the land that you've been talking about does not cover that scope. Can you confirm, uh, clarify specifically why not? Um, that is a serious concern of mine. Again, thank you for crushing that. I'm so impressed, thank you. Thank you for your comment. So our next speaker is Karen Grove, followed by Sally. Um, good evening, I'm Karen Grove. I'm a Menlo Park resident. 
and a Cal grad, go bears. Um, and I'm so, and a former housing commissioner, as you know, but the students don't. I'm so excited about all these presentations. It is so wonderful to see a beautiful, vibrant, multi-generational vision of, of what we've been talking about. Um, it's just so appealing and so exciting. Um, I love that the students use stories to sh illustrate the internal and external features of the development, because that really is what it's all about. It's about people who are going to have homes and lives and connections and relationships. Um, and we want to make that possible. I love also in the other presentation, the flexibility to see how things go and reassess the parking need. And maybe we can get more housing and less parking. That's a very non-threatening way to approach that possibility. And so we only embrace it if it's real at the time. Um, and just a quick story. When I started attending city council meetings, somebody from Housing Leadership Council came up during the discussion of potentially up redoing the Ariaga Library and said, I mean, Ariaga came forward with a donation proposal to redo the downtown library right here. And I made a public comment that that's a really lovely offer, but we have our priorities and they are housing, affordable housing, preventing homelessness, and maybe we should address those life altering things before the nice things because we already have a library. And also there was concern about Bellhaven being the priority for libraries. Housing Leadership Council came up and didn't opine on the library, but they said, if you do build the library, consider putting affordable housing above it. And I was like, oh, my head is blown. Soon after that, because that's such a beautiful vision. Um, soon after that, I, I went to a Rockwood Institute uh, leadership course. And part of that is articulating your sort of personal mission and your vision for what drives your work. And I described to the class this idea of affordable housing downtown at the library, walkable to downtown, accessible to public transit. And the feedback on my presentation was, you have got to work on that because we can see on your face and in your body how much, you know, you can see it. And I could, and I can, and I'm really grateful that these students have presented it so that all of us can see it. And um, so thank you. And I do hope that we can share this more broadly so that others can share the vision. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Um, our next speaker is Sally, and this will be the final call for public comment on agenda item H1. Hello, everyone. Um, you know, I just want to say my comments are going to be a little different than the ones before me. Um, as a taxpayer and a resident in Menlo Park who pays a lot of money and has paid a lot of money in property taxes and who owns and relies on my car, I'm concerned to hear, and I'm going to throw out the statistics that I heard during the presentations, forgive me if I don't have them exactly right, but with one of the developments, I heard a 20% loss of current parking. I heard half a stall for each new home. I don't know how someone is supposed to park their car in half a stall. Um, I also heard for another portion of the development, I think it was a 0.7 or 0.75 to one replacement parking. Again, that's not full replacement and 0.8 parking spaces um, to one unit, if I have that correct. So I rely on the parking in order to do business and shop in downtown Menlo Park. And I'm disturbed to hear that it's being treated so casually as if it doesn't matter. And I would just remind folks that most people in the community do have a car and rely on a car. So if you cut out the parking, then we're gonna be looking to go elsewhere to do our shopping. So that's number one. Um, you know, the, the other thing is I appreciate the efforts of the students, but. I would question the design of, of what was shown. In some cases, it looked a lot like block housing to me. And I know that cost is obviously a concern, but I'm wondering why it is that we had so much money to build a, a beautiful um, fire department. It looks great. And yet we don't, or we're not spending the money to build something that's going to impact the character of downtown Menlo Park uh, into the future, the foreseeable future. 
And so um, I don't care for what I saw as far as the design. I would like to see something beautiful if this is what we're going to do with Menlo Park. And I'd like to have less density, not more, in order to keep the suburban feel that has characterized Menlo Park since its existence. We're not a city, um, but we're looking to become one. And again, as a taxpayer who pays the bills, um, I'm, I'm not okay with that. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. I am seeing no further hands or cards. So Mayor Willison, you may continue. Thank you, City Clerk Heron. And thank you to all of the public commenters that um, commented tonight. So at this point, I would like to offer my colleagues an opportunity to comment or ask a few questions. Um, I would say we should try to keep this relatively short. Um, I would love to spend hours discussing, um, but this is a presentation um, and we, I know we'll have a lot more conversations um, later. So, would anyone like to say anything? Council Member Nash. So I was really, really excited by this presentation. I actually think that it is a fabulous look at what we need downtown, where we do need lots of affordable housing. And this is something that the state mandates in addition to the fact that we need it for Menlo Park. We need places where our teachers can live. We need places where our staff can live. We also need places where people who are working downtown can live. Otherwise we will not have be able to maintain the retail, our restaurants, all of that. And then for all the people who want to come back to the area after they go to um, a way to school or to jobs, um, we need to have a place for people to move into the community um, at all stages of their life. And I think it is wonderful. I hope we do more with it. Um, to the folks who are concerned about parking, there is plenty of parking around if we use it properly. One of the things that we're using our downtown lots for primarily, I believe, is for folks who are working for retail workers and for people who are um, downtown um, actually doing jobs. And if we were to able, if we were able to come up with a system where we can have lots for people who are working and we can still have them um, parking, but not in our downtown lots, there actually would be much more lot, much more parking available for customers and people who need to be downtown. So I think it's a matter of actually just better utilizing all of our space, um, the parking spaces um, for downtown for housing is a wonderful use. It's one of the only ways we will actually be able to meet our state mandates um, to for affordable housing, which again, we all need in addition to them being state mandates. And I really um, applaud what both groups did. I think they're very exciting and I hope we are able to um, to show them to more members of the community, have it online and possibly have it um, somewhere either on campus, their um, city campus here or somewhere downtown and um, get people excited about this. Thank you so much. Thank you, Council Member Nash. Um, uh, Council Member Dorr. Yes, I just wanna thank the student groups for presenting today. Um, you guys are going to be future city staff, future developers, future community members, and it is really uh, enlightening to see what could development look like in these different plans. And so thank you for sharing your visions and ideas with us. And thank you for choosing these careers and for going down this path. And I wish you the most success in everything you do. And, um, you know, reflecting on the housing element that we've, we've been working on this year, HTD said we must prioritize affordable housing on city owned parking lots. And so I'm especially grateful that this project is looking at the uh, opportunities to advance affordable housing um, and also create livable spaces and other uses for our community. And so thank you so much for this idea that I hope we as a city can continue to 
play with in the coming months and years. So thanks. Council Member Combs. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mayor Nash. Uh, th thank you to the, the students for all of uh, um, what was obvious, a lot of time and work that you put into the, the, the presentations, which were really, really thoughtful. Um, and, and thank you for, for presenting here at, at, at the, the council meeting. Um, what I would, would just say is that, <clears throat> yeah, obviously you've gotten a, a lot of praise. Um, I would be mindful of, of like thinking about as you look at these projects and, and where your, your uh, careers go, is how do you bring along those people who see this and don't see themselves reflected in it, right? Because that's, that's gonna be really important um, because it, you transition from a winning sort of academic competition and grades to like, how do you actually get it built? And certainly part of it is, is money. Certainly part of it is inspiring people um, with a bold vision of where the community goes. But also part of it is convincing those people who are, are not so enamored, uh, uh, um, convincing those people who don't see themselves in that bold vision. And so I would just you know, leave you with that charge is like, how, how do you bring, what's, what's your response? How do you bring those people along? Because that's going to be the key to, to success, trans, trans, translating all of that work into actual, like sort of impact and into actual um, something that the whole community can be proud of. But again, thank you. Uh, really, really great work all around. Thank you, Council Member Combs. Uh, Vice Mayor Taylor. Okay. Um, well, I just want to reiterate my appreciation and enthusiasm and support um, to all of the um, groups that put their semester into re-envisioning um, and giving us a first pass at what is possible downtown. Um, and so thank you. Thank you for coming. Um, Vice Mayor Taylor actually whispered to me, like, maybe we could put this downtown. Maybe the design district wants to, to host um, some of this stuff. Um, we have a, an up and coming, uh, or we have a group that's formed uh, with architects and designers and furniture stores and whatnot. And this, I don't know if, if you're leaving this with us. Um, oh, that's amazing. So um, there might be a home for this and as a jumping off point to have people start to imagine. Um, and we wish you um, all the success. Um, I know your semester is ending, but uh, feel you have my info's on the website. If you want to find out what happens, um, just check in with we're, we're here every other Tuesday night. Uh, you can tune in and find out what happens with the downtown parking lots. But um, actually, I'm going to ask staff for a moment just to let the public know um, we do have a program in the housing element to look at downtown parking lots. Um, does anyone on staff can can speak to kind of what our community's next step is in terms of um, moving forward with what we're going to do um, professionally on this? Um, I know I'm putting you on the spot. If if not, uh, we can do another time. But Ms. Chow, if you want to just um, highlight for those who tuned into this to get inspired and they're kind of like, all right, let's go, let's let's see how we can make this happen. Um, what what should they expect? Great, thank you. Good evening, Mayor Wollison, Deanna Chow, Assistant Community Development Director, and I'll echo the Go Bears. Um, so uh, yeah, so very inspiring uh, presentations by the groups. And I'll mention that there was a third group that wasn't able to pre uh, present this evening, but um, truly inspiring in, in what these uh, talented students are able to achieve. So we definitely look forward to our next steps. We still need to outline that. As you mentioned, uh, there is a program in our housing element that does look at uh, reimagining our downtown parking lots for affordable housing. Our first effort will be to probably bring on a consultant to do an assessment and analysis of what is feasible, what are the constraints, what are the opportunities. Um, so that is the the next next step in, in what we'll be embarking on. Thank you. And we do have a line item in the CIP, which is coming up to do just that. That That is correct. We looked at... Um, sort of reworking uh, what was the sort of a garage by itself into um, the, the, the assessment of um, the parking lots. Thank you. And then I think the last request was, is to, um, if you can connect with the UC Berkeley folks to somehow get whatever they're comfortable sharing 
so we can have that on our website or potentially set up something downtown if if there's a way to share out this information broadly with the community. Yes, we, we will do that. Thank you so much. Thanks. Um, so thank you again. Um, I would um, like to now take a 10 minute break and invite members of the public to um, check out what the students brought um, to use the restroom. And then we're gonna reconvene at 810 with our meeting. Thank you.
Okay, helping our city council back at our days. Mayor Woolison, you may reconvene the meeting. Thank you, City Clerk Karen. We are now moving on to item I, which is our consent calendar. Under the consent calendar, the city council may take action to approve routine business items in one motion, unless a city council member, city staff member, or a member of the public requests that an item be discussed or continued to a later date. City Clerk Karen, can you please call for public comment on the consent calendar? Yes, thank you, Mayor Willison. So at this time, if any member of the public wishes to provide comment on any of our consent calendar items, I-1, City Council Meeting Minutes, I-2, the Complete Streets Recommendation for the Ravenswood Avenue Bike Lane Pilot, I-3, authorizing the mayor uh, to sign an amendment with the San Francisco or San Francisco Creek Joint Powers Authority, I-4, authorizing the mayor to sign a letter on behalf of City Council to PG&E regarding extended power outages, I-5, receiving the City Council Priority Goal Setting Workshop Final Report. I-6, receiving and filing the investment portfolio as of March 31st. Or I-7, adopting a resolution to execute an agreement with Habitat for Humanity Greater San Francisco related to the notice of affordability. If you are participating virtually, please engage that hand feature bottom of your screen or calling in please press star nine. If in person, please complete a speaker card at the back table and return to me. Final call for public comment on our consent calendar items I-1 through I-7. Seeing no hands or cards. Mayor Willison, you may continue. Thank you so much. So bringing it up to the dais, um, are there any items on the consent calendar that the council would like to pull or discuss. Mayor Willison, I, I have a comment on uh, two items. Are there any other items? Or well, why don't uh, why don't we start with you and <laughs> find out what they are and then and go from there. Thank you. And I'll make this quick. Um, I, I have a comment on I-3. It's actually a thank you to both the Menlo Park City staff and the San Francisco Creek JPA staff, and also a thank you to our um, city council member Combs um, for being the chair as well. You want me to keep going? Thank you. Uh, my next comment is on I-4. This is the, the letter um, for, for you to sign for PG&E. Um, I am hoping that in the future that considering the number of claims that were denied for the PG&E outage, that there can be some consideration for all the claims to actually be approved and it can be paid for through PG&E's foundation. Thank you. Um, so actually I have a clarifying question for staff on this letter. Um, is there an opportunity to amend the letter at this point? Yes, we would be happy to take amendments. Okay, so um, Vice Mayor Taylor, would you like to um, direct staff to, can we um, still approve the item with some directed action wording changes? Yes. Okay, Vice Mayor Taylor, is there specific uh, changes you would like at this time added? Yes, thank you. Um, do I need to make the motion first and then add it to the motion? Or just add it. Can she just tell you, and then when we make the motion, we can say it's with those previously referenced wording Thank changes. Thank you. Um, the additions I'd like to see added is with any long-term power outages. Power outages that the claims that were that claims will be approved, and that PG&E will consider using their foundation money to cover the expense. So I'm comfortable with those changes. Um, I'm seeing a nod. I'm, uh, uh, are you comfortable with those changes? Okay, uh, Council Member Nash. So if we're making changes, I was wondering if um, staff thinks it's worthwhile adding um, a request for reimbursement for the hotels that we, um, the city paid for. We can certainly make that request or make mention of the total amount that we've spent in that paragraph on everything we did to respond to the storms too. And a quick follow-up, how much did the city spend on those hotel rooms? Just shy of $30,000. All 
Yes, my mom always told me it doesn't hurt to ask. <laughs> so, okay, I'm seeing nods for that addition as well. Okay, um, Vice Mayor Taylor, um, any other? Okay, um, Councilmember Combs, did you have something? Yeah, I'd like to move I2 um, from the consent calendar. Okay, would you like to comment on it or just remove it? I, I'd like to remove it um, to because I am in support of everything else on the consent calendar, okay. and so I want to be able to vote separately. I do have s separate comments. I can make them now, or I can make them at the time of a split. Whatever okay. works for you, you <laughs> tell me. Um, are there any other items that a council member would like to discuss or pull from the consent calendar? Uh, council member Dorf? Just a small note that it says San Francisco Creek instead of San Francisco Creek in 1-3. Thanks. Thanks for that clarification, council member Dorf. Okay, so it sounds like, um, why don't we go ahead and, um, does someone wanna move all items other than I-2, which council member Combs would like to um, vote on separately? I would move all items other than I too. Okay, is there a second? I'll second. Thank you. Okay, so we have a motion on the table by city council member Doer, second by vice mayor Taylor to approve the consent calendar with edits to item I-4 and with the exception of item I-2. Any further city council question or discussion? Nope, seeing none by roll call vote, city council member Combs. Yes. City Council Member Dower. Yes. City Council Member Nash. Yes. Vice Mayor Taylor. Yes. Mayor Willison. Yes. And the motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll turn it over to you, City Council Member Combs. Uh, thank you. I, I won't. Um, obviously, I've, I've raised some concerns and objections um, to this project in the past, which I, I won't repeat. But th there are some process questions I have. So. Um, it, it is titled as confirmed complete streets commission recommendation to make the Ravenswood Avenue bike lane pilot permanent. So what, what we're doing is making the bike lane permanent or the bank bike lane pilot permanent, correct? To staff. Hi, uh, System Public Works Director Q Louch for transportation. Um, yeah, the it, this would be making it permanent. Okay, so two things. I would, I don't know if this is something I've noticed in the past, but obviously I've not or something I, I would actually ask in the future that the verbiage be that like we confirm or, or that we make a pilot permanent because here it seems like we're confirming the complete streets commission or the recommendation which yeah we can confirm that they made that recommendation but I think what we need to make clear here is that what we're doing here is council action that makes something permanent um and and I, I think that it, it can be not as clear when it says that we are confirming some action that a commission did, when in fact what we're doing is, is making, like I say, um, a, a change permanent, uh, and that's based on, on the council action. So, so I, th I think that going forward, we should um, we, we should be careful in, in, in the verbiage we use. Secondly, I would ask that in the future that like when there are pilot programs that they not be on the consent calendar. One of the things we say when we discuss pilot programs is this idea that like it's a pilot and it's gonna come back. Um, and, and, and that is very much what we use to frame it as a way to get people to be okay with it. Well, if it comes back as a consent calendar item, I, I think that like then that somehow lessens when we make the argument that the, it's gonna come back to council. I think it should come back as a regular agenda item so that then we are re-looking at it um, in full. Even if there are scenarios where there isn't much disagreement, I still think for, again, just a matter of process as the way we tend to present pilots that when they come back, they should come back not on the consent calendar, but as as as, a, as regular agenda items. Thank you, Councilman. Those are my comments. Thank you, Council Member Combs. And Mayor Willis and I do apologize. I had one public comment on this item I too. Um, yes, that's fine, Judy. Great. So I will invite up Jackie Cibrian. Hi, uh, council members. I'm Jackie Sebri and I'm vice chair of the Complete Streets Commission, but I'm really here to talk to you as a bike commuter who actively uses that Ravenswood bike lane. And um, earlier this evening, there was a comment in the uh, during the question about the noise um, quiet zones and how 
people didn't realize how much they would miss, how much that noise was impacting them until it was gone. And that is exactly how I would describe that bike lane. Like I was pretty comfortable. I even knew going into the discussion that I was pretty comfortable with how it already was, but I cannot tell you how much I love and how much safer it feels riding down Ravenswood, not having to sort of gird yourself in advance of that block to see which cars are going to try to merge around you. And so to get to that intersection and just be able to ride smoothly for, through, it really like reduces the stress load. Um, and so I am super happy to um, absolutely advocate that you keep that bike lane because I think we're gonna get even more bike traffic and the safer we make it, the more parents will let their kids ride bikes to school and other places. So thanks. Thank you for your comment. And I did receive an additional card, uh, Sally Cole. Hello, I'm Sally Cole, Complete Streets Commission. And I wanted to speak in support of um, making the pilot of the bike lane uh, and those two blocks of Ravenswood permanent. Uh, we considered this at the commission and we did have a unanimous vote to make it permanent. Uh, one of the things I just wanted to highlight tonight is that in March when the council asked the public to submit comments for your priority setting session, um, safe streets came up again and again, but one of the top comments um, or suggestions from the public about safe streets was please city council help us create a continuous and safe network um, of bike, a bike network, network, excuse me, around the city. Um, and the only way we're gonna do that is to fill in gaps. And this two block, this just two block stretch on Ravenswood where there isn't a bike lane, where there's a bike lane before and after is exactly what that is. It's one of those gaps. So I would like to ask the city, excuse me, the city council to think about this decision as one small step of filling in these gaps around the city and ultimately getting to that vision of a continuous network, which is going to really improve the quality of life here and is something that our residents have asked for. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. And that is the final card I have on I2, as well as no further hands. Thank so. you, City Clerk Heron. Um, with that, I will move to um, confirm the Complete Seats Streets Commission recommend. I will move to make the Ravenswood Avenue bike lane pilot <laughs> permanent. <laughs> I will second. Thank you. So I have a motion on the floor by Mayor Willison and a second by City Council Member Nash to confirm the recommendation from the Complete Streets Commission to make Ravenswood Bike Avenue pilot permanent as part of the resurfacing of Ravenswood Avenue, which began at the end of April, 2023 and will be complete by June, 2023. Any further city council question or discussion? Mm -hmm. Seeing none by roll call vote, city council member Combs. No. City council member Dower. Yes. City council member Nash. Yes. Vice Mayor Taylor? Yes. Mayor Willison? Yes. And the motion passes with City Council Member Combs dissenting. Thank you. Thank you, City Clerk Karen. We are now moving on to J, regular business. Under regular business, the City Council considers recommendations from City staff on policy matters or administrative actions that require City Council approval. The regular business item is J1, provide direction on the five-year capital improvement plan. To introduce this item is our Assistant Public Works Director, Tanisha Warner. Good evening, Ms. Warner. Good evening. Just need one moment. Okay. All right. Good evening, Mayor Wilson, city council members and members of the public. My name is Tanisha Werner. I'm the Assistant Public Works Director for Engineering. And tonight I'll be giving a presentation on our capital improvement plan. For tonight's presentation, I'll give an overview of the CIP, highlight a few current key projects, and then highlight a few new project requests that have been received go over our next steps in our process, and then at the end, we have time to answer any questions you may have. 
So the CAP represents the community's vision for short and long range planning for infrastructure assets. Our proposed plan has been developed from input from other city departments, and it's been checked for consist consistency with city council priorities and goals. The 2023-28 program has 80 funded projects. These projects are divided into seven categories, and those categories include buildings and systems, environment, parks and recreation, stormwater, streets and sidewalks, traffic and transportation, and water system. Our program also includes a few programmatic categories, such as parks minor, sports field, renovations and traffic signal modifications. The program is updated annually. The CIP is funded from various sources. There is a $3 million general fund appropriation and funding also comes from grants, dedicated sources for water, transportation impact, stormwater, solid waste and development agreement community benefits, as well as prior year fiscal uh, prior fiscal year surplus revenues, which are used to pre-fund projects. And one example of pre-funding a project in the past has been the Chrysler stormwater pump station. CIP spans many different areas and each year Public Works receives many project requests for funding. While we make an effort to fund as many projects as we can, Unfortunately, we're not able to fund all of the projects. We look at ways to prioritize those projects and that's through the city council goals. We also have tier designations, which have tier one as the highest, tier two being a medium level priority and tier three being a low level priority, as well as looking at master planning efforts, And then um, of, our, of our 80 projects this year, staff is proposing to add $13 million in additional funding for 26 of those projects. Staff is also looking at allocating an additional $5 million from the general capital funding, which includes a $3 million annual transfer and a $2 million use of carryover balance. Some of the unfunded project needs have been initiated from the round of storms that we experienced in winter 2023. And those include Alpine Road Trail under Juniper Cerro, um, Cerro Boulevard, as well as the San, San Francisco Creek Embankment, which has experienced a lot of erosion over at Alma Street. Project delivery for the CIP is ongoing no matter what the season is. And I'm gonna highlight three current projects for you this evening. And these are from our 22-23 capital improvement plan. The first is the 2023 street resurfacing program. This program has a budget of $2.8 million. And on April 4th, a contract was awarded to G Bertolotto and company for uh, the overlay of 2.3 million, 2.3 miles of streets, and that includes 16 street segments. Another project that I'm going to highlight for you is the Chrysler Stormwater Pump Station. This project will be introducing a brand new piece of infrastructure into our system. It will be a new stormwater pump station. The project was awarded on February 28th and construction is identified to begin in May of this year. Our contractor is Anderson Pacific Construction and we have approximately 450 working days to complete the project, which equates to just under two calendar years. The next project that I wanna highlight is the Willow Oaks and Burgess Park improvements. And this project is currently out to public bid. The project has a combined budget of $4.3 million and bids will be opened on May 24th of this year. Staff anticipates going to council for an award of contract in June and we look to schedule a pop-up event in the park this weekend on May 13th. And that's just to share some information with members of the public 
on the improvements that are proposed. For Willow Oaks, we're looking at providing a new playground, new dog park, and picnicking areas. And at Burgess Park, we're looking at a new playground. Of the eight new projects that are proposed for funding this year, I'm going to highlight three of them. The first is electrical vehicle chargers at city facilities. This project is seeking $973,189 of new funding. It is needed to support some of our immediate need for EV chargers and also to support the council's goal of uh, the 2030 cap goal of electrifying the fee. The next project that I'm going to highlight is uh, building exterior improvements. And this project is seeking $700,000 in new funding. And it's proposed so that we can ready key buildings for solar installation. And this includes roof replacements. Any funding that's not used for the roof replacements will be carried over for exterior improvements such as painting and window door and siding replacement. And then the final project that I wanna highlight for you this evening is the Caltrain Quiet Zone Evaluation. So this is not a new project. The project is currently in pre-design or a study phase. We're proposing to add $550,000 in new funding and $300,000 will be um, from carryover funds, which will help continue our efforts to implement grade crossing improvements, which are needed to establish the quiet zone and funding is proposed from the Downtown Amenity Fund. We have some really great projects planned in our 80 project catalog for the CIP. And then after tonight's presentation, um, we'll be seeking council direction and feedback on how we prioritize projects and also the selection process that we use for identifying new projects. Uh, with that direction, staff will prepare the draft 2023-28 CIP. On June 1st, we will be looking at a budget workshop. And then on June 5th, we will be going to the Planning Commission to verify conformance with the general plan. And later in June, uh, we will have our City Council public hearings and the adoption of the Operating and Capital Improvement Program. Um, I just wanna briefly circle back to the recommendation that's in our staff report and just um, let everyone know that we're seeking direction to either confirm or modify criteria, which is used to identify and prioritize projects. Uh, we wanna confirm that the tier designation on how we prioritize projects is still representative of our council's goals. And it's also adequately representing priority levels for the community. And we'd also like to seek feedback on the new project requests. And that concludes my slides. I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you very much, Ms. Werner. Um, I think before any council questions, unless there's a burning question, um, we will move to public comments. So City Clerk Karen, can you please um, see how many public commenters we have this evening? Yes, thank you, Mayor Willison. So at this time, if any member of the public wishes to provide comment on our regular business item, J1, provide direction on the five-year capital improvement plan. If you're participating virtually, please engage that hand feature in the bottom of your screen. If you're calling in from a landline or a cell phone, please press star nine. If you are participating in chambers, please complete a speaker card at that back table and return the card to me. Okay, so Mayor Wilson, at this time, we are at about 14 speakers. Okay, thank you, City Clerk Karen. So in order to get out of here before too late, we'll do two minutes for each public comment, please. Thank you. So our first speaker will be David uh, Ortel, followed by A. Williams. Can you hear me okay? Uh, I've been measuring the decibel levels of Caltrain on my property for over two years using calibrated equipment. And I found that the intensity of horn noise varies, but not in a good way. Multiple times a week, I record horn volumes in excess of 120 decibels. 
That's more than 10 times the intensity limit specified by the Federal Railroad Administration. It's certainly beyond accepted safe levels of environmental noise. Uh, please keep this excess in mind when considering the health costs of living and working in our city. I have never got used to the Caltrain noise, and every day and night I'm interrupted in my work and my sleep, and I worry about the insidious effects on my health, and especially for the health of my family. I'm sure you understand the importance of good sleep for the healthy development of young people. I have a 15-year-old child, and getting healthy sleep is a real problem for him. So I urge you to do uh, whatever you can to protect our children and our families from this pernicious health issue. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. So our next speaker will be A. Williams, followed by Adam Tobin. Hi, thank you. Um, my name is Aubrey Williams. Um, I'm a Men Menlo Park resident located between Noel Drive and Ravenswood Avenue, or I'm sorry, off of Noel Drive between Ravenswood Avenue and Oak Grove. Um, I pretty much live between both stops directly across from the Caltrain station. Um, and I'm actually here to state my opposition to the rail quiet zone. After narrowly escaping a $6.4 million deficit in funding, it seems wildly irresponsible to allot the projected 90 to $240,000 for design work. This feels all the more outrageous of an expenditure when we take a moment to recognize that between 2019 and 2022, we have seen more than a 20% increase in homeless people within our community and city workers who are unable to maintain local housing, due to high cost of living. There's clearly still a great need in our community for supportive services, even if it isn't immediately apparent to those currently sitting in this room. Uh, the Menlo Park Caltrain platform has been here much longer than many of our residents. And though the noise may be a nuisance for some, this is a choice you make when choosing to live next to a train station and the same choice made by citizens of Palo Alto, Sunnyvale, Santa Clara, and the like. I find it troubling that while many people say that it's difficult to get used to the sound of a train, we are all too comfortable with seeing people in our community struggle. Um, we can't say not in my backyard when we actively choose to set our backyards next to a train station. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. So our next speaker is Adam Tobin, followed by Linda Lee. Hi, good evening. Hi. Uh, I'm Adam Tobin. I'm a resident of Menlo Park. I'm very much in favor of the rail quiet zone. I'm here to read a comment in support of the quiet zone from Greg Kuzia Carmel, chef and owner of Camper on Santa Cruz Ave and Canteen on Oak Grove, who cannot be here this evening. His statement is as follows. Dear Council, as one of the entrepreneurs who has invested in bringing lifestyle and hospitality businesses to downtown Menlo Park, I'm intimately aware of all the dynamics that impact my ventures here in town. Without a shadow of a doubt, the cacophony of horns at all hours of the day that interrupt business meetings, collegial get togethers, and whatever reason our guests decide to patronize my establishments are a net negative to us economically and aspirationally. Menlo Park would do us a great service by advancing these measures and stands positioned to positively impact enterprises new and existing throughout the town by establishing a quiet zone. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. The next step is Linda Lee followed by Rishiraj Paravaha. Hi, my name's Linda Lee. I'm a resident in uh, Menlo Park. I've had my condo for 12 years, I think. Uh, I bought it knowing it was on the railway line. Um, I think the comments from others, and uh, I echo those, is it's significantly uh, different. It's much higher. It's much, much more intrusive. Um, and I appreciate that there are safety issues uh, and so on, but I believe that the increase is intrusive and I would strongly urge any uh, recognition of a quiet zone. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Next is Risha Raja, followed by Alex Johnson. Hi, my name is Rishiraj. 
Uh, I'm a recent resident of Menlo Park, and I want to kind of emphasize the safety issues that are here. Uh, first of all, the reason the train honks the horn is because the engineer or whoever feels that there might be safety concerns in the track. So if there are railroad crossings and guards, that does not allow a car or enable a car to go past into the railway's tracks, then that concern is alleviated. So in today's date, why do we have railway crossings where we are making people unsafe on the streets? I'll give you an example. The other day, the railway crossing uh, levers were malfunctioning on Glenwood Drive. My wife was there in the car with my children, two little kids, and there were cars who were passing through from the other side because it was malfunctioning. There were no trains around. It was a false positive. But in this situation, you have a, we have a situation where cars are able to get on the tracks while the train is there or not, doesn't matter. Let's make it such that cars are unable or anybody is unable to get on the tracks when that situation demands, whether it's a false positive or a train is coming. As a result, we'll have a quiet zone. So I support the quiet zone, not just for the health of our residents around, around uh, downtown, but also for the safety of everybody who comes to Menlo Park, works at Menlo Park, works all around and lives all around. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. So next up is Alex Johnson, followed by Sloan Citron. Uh, good evening. My name is Alex Johnson, and I strongly support the creation of a quiet zone. My family has owned property in Menlo Park since 1979. I moved to Menlo Park in 2014 and have lived in their townhouse on San Antonio Avenue in Garwood Way, which directly parallels the Caltrain tracks between the Ensenal and Glenwood crossings. The pavement of Garwood Way is the only separation between my home and the train tracks. Since 2014, I've never gotten used to the blaring, screeching, ear shattering, and deafening horns the trains produce, often constantly. We all suffer from the noise nuisance of the horn. Even tonight during this meeting, you can hear it interrupting the presentations and comments, and my home is ground zero for the worst of it. Last summer, I was excited to host a family friend from Germany working at Stanford for a month. Upon waking from his first night at my home, he let me know he would need to find housing elsewhere as he couldn't sleep due to the train horn. He even went as far as measuring the horn's decibels and let me know that they are higher than what is legally allowable in Germany. I was embarrassed and sad he was not able to finish out his month with me and had to leave after only one night. In addition, I've given up trying to rent the extra bedrooms in my home due to potential renters literally being driven away by the horn. They left before even entering my home because they were so disturbed by the horns while they were parking. This is upsetting for me because I'd love the extra income a renter would provide and should disappoint you as well because I know the city desperately needs all the affordable housing options it can get. I think back to the earlier housing presentations tonight and the idyllic heartwarming dreams they told of future renters, but how quickly those dreams would turn to nightmare with the reality of the horns disrupting their peaceful way of life. Lastly, I've spent tens of thousands of dollars upgrading all the doors and windows in my home with the sole purpose of combating the noise from the train horns to no avail. I say this to demonstrate that personally, I've exhausted all means of trying to combat the discomfort and misery the train horns cause. Please help me and my neighbors. I urge you to consider and implore you to support a quiet zone. Please devote the time and resources needed to create the quiet zone. Your citizens would greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Next is Sloan Citron, followed by Joanne Goldberg. Good evening. Uh, I'm Sloan Citron. I've lived in Felton Gables for close to 30 years. I've had businesses um, right near the train station for another 30 years. And the train noise has certainly gotten much worse over time to the point where we actually had to put in air conditioning to combat the noise, um, which is a waste of electricity when you, when we have a time where we're trying to keep that down. Um, I'm here specifically though to read a comment about the rail quiet zone from the owners and managers of five Menlo Park hotels located on the rail corridor. The timing of this meeting precludes them from attending in person. They are Greg Alden of Stanford Park Hotel, Reed Moulds of the Marriott Residence Inn, Perry Patel of the Best Western Riviera and the Hotel Lucent, 
and Mike Casey of the Park James Hotel. Their statement is as follows. Dear Council, the guests, diners, and visitors at our five Menlo Park hotels are regularly impacted by the disruptive blasting of train horns. It affects guest sleep and enjoyment at our properties, including outdoor dining and poolside recreation. The incessant loud noise reduces the quality of hospitality that the city has to offer visitors and is a constant and consistent source of complaint. Also, as you know, hotels are one of the largest contributors to the city's tax base with our transient occupancy tax. Given the disruption of the train noise to guest sleep and their quiet enjoyment of our properties, we've lost guests to hotels in downtown Palo Alto and other neighboring cities. Train horn noise not only harms our businesses' reputations and leads to a loss of business, but also directly reduces tax dollars to the city as a result. We support and are grateful for council and staff's work to end the horns to date. We urge you to approve funding for final designs and move forward with this necessary step. When the horns are finally quieted, Menlo Park will become an appreciably more hospitable place to do business and frankly to live and for guests, diners and shoppers to patronize. All of us and the city at large will benefit immensely from reducing the noise. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comment. Next is Joanne Goldberg, followed by Vince Bressler. Good evening, Mayor and Council members. I'm Joanne Goldberg here in Linfield Oaks, and I am speaking on behalf of the Quiet Zone. I want to address several points that were made at the last meeting where this was discussed. The first is equity and potentially skewing city resources to a narrow group of residents. We don't minimize the importance of the equity imbalance in Menlo Park or its longstanding root causes. However, it's not accurate to paint train horns as a wealthy single family homeowner issue. The majority of the residences closest to the four crossings and subject to the greatest disturbances are rentals and multi-unit complexes. Additionally, with the city's emphasis on building affordable housing close to transit, the less affluent residents who move into that housing will bear the brunt of the incessant horn noise. Constantly clanging horns also negatively impacts shared public spaces like Burgess Park, the city center, and the library and the council chambers. As local businesses have expressed just now, blaring horns turn off visitors and guests to our residents, our restaurants and hotels. The second issue is liability. As Atherton verified, as long as a quiet zone has been properly declared and is in good standing, a city does not bear liability for train incidents due to fewer horns. The third point relates to the fact that a quiet zone does not eliminate every single horn. Train engineers will always have discretion to use the horn. However, in Menlo Park, a quiet zone will eliminate more than 95% of the nearly 1,700 horns sounded every weekday. Currently, there are about 16 blasts for every train that goes through our city. Even if there's one blast at the station, 15 blasts will be gone and that's huge. I also note that during the community meeting, the Kim Lee Horn consultant pointed out that quiet zones in areas like ours, with our four crossings in close proximity to each other, eliminate the problem of alarm fatigue. The horns are blasting so often that people kind of tune them out often. Without the constant blaring of horns, it's much more likely that people will notice and pay attention when a horn does blow. Finally, I would like to ask that all the people who are here for Quiet Zone, please stand up so the council can see how many of us there are. Thank you, and thank you for your consideration. Thank you for your comment. So our next speaker is Vince Bressler, followed by Adina Levin. Hi, uh, Vince Bressler long-term Menlo Park resident, former planning commissioner. I'm here to speak in support of the quiet zone funding for the capital improvement program. Uh, and in response to concerns expressed at the last city council meeting regarding uh, safety and costs. Um, there's an option 
called risk assessment. And, and in that approach, only two intersections out of four would be uh, upgraded. Those two intersections apply uh, include 75% of the traffic. So um, the final design for those crossings is estimated to be between um, $350,000 and $500,000, but thanks to Springline's uh, contribution, $260,000 already in the budget for that, earmarked for quiet zones. Therefore, um, the balance required for fiscal year uh, 24 would be only ninety dollars to uh, $240,000. Upgrading only these two busiest intersections will make the Menlo Park corridor fully compliant with FRA standards for a quiet zone at half the cost. Okay. This is a investment in rail safety and quality of life grants and other funding sources may cover some of the costs. Also, given our great interest in uh, populating the rail corridor with new residents, it seems that it behooves us to make their quality of life reasonable and also make the quality of life improved for other residents of Menlo Park. This is uh, something that I believe we should fund. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. So next up is Adina Levin, followed by Jeff Schmidt. Good evening, Mayor, City Council members and staff, Adina Levin, Menlo Park resident. Um, so uh, uh, with the regard to the capital improvement uh, uh, plan, the um, in the city council goal setting, as uh, has been mentioned before, one of the key um, goals is improving uh, the uh, safety of our streets. And there are a number of uh, good um, uh, items in the um, that are in the CIP along those lines. And um, one thing that is was um, it would be uh, great to hear uh, more about as it's going to be coming forward is um, improvements to the safety uh, of uh, Willow north of 101 on the street itself um, and the street crossings. Um, this is a significant problem that really needs repair um, with the community north of 101 being having historically been a sacrifice zone to cars coming to and from the freeway, and there are a lot of safety improvement uh, opportunities. Um, uh, look forward to that coming forward. Um, there's been um, longstanding plans to improve safety of uh, on El Camino Real, and um, it's great to see the crosswalks going in. Um, there's also opportunities, especially as there are new developments opening up along 101 for the um, moving forward potentially on the long awaited bike lanes that other cities are starting to move forward as that corridor has been identified as the um, uh, a corridor. So I uh, would be interested in, in uh, also seeing potentially that moving forward, uh, uh, support the quiet zones and also think that that should not be in contrast to supporting affordable housing and services for uh, homelessness. And as the, our city's housing plans move forward, I am hope to see funding plans for affordable housing coming forward to at a later date. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. So next up is Jeff Schmidt, followed by Carrie. Um, hi, Jeff Schmidt, Menlo Park resident, um, and happy to be an EQC member for one year out of a four-year term. So thank you very much for that. Um, I, well, I'm not going to talk about trains. Uh, I want to bring to the council something um, that we're really passionate about on the EQC, uh, which is our urban canopy and the trees in our city. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about um, the, the benefits of trees, and I'm not here to convince you of the basics of that. But um, there are some things going on in Bellhaven that I wanted to make sure everyone was aware of because the canopy is really different in our districts compared to Bellhaven. And I've had the pleasure of attending a lot of the meetings there and hear the topic come up a lot uh, in those discussions. Um, the citizens there, they, they know it, they see it, they feel it. Um, and there are fewer trees there overall, and there are more being removed for a lot of different reasons. So 
when we combine that with a lot of other issues around disproportionate development and air quality that's worse than our other districts, um, historical environmental justice issues, I think we have a real issue that it would be great for the city council to just um, keep top of mind as much as possible. The good news is there's work happening. We have a group that's come together to work on our urban forest master plan. Um, Canopy has been a partner. Jillian, Rebecca, and her city staff team, we wrote a grant for various reasons that didn't make it through. So the request tonight is um, if you could make the Urban Forest Master Plan a priority, hopefully a tiered priority, according to that scale, if you could consider adding a bit more budget. Um, we're not asking for a million dollars, but a bit more to help get more done faster. Um, and then please ask the city um, staff to continue to collaborate with Canopy and the EQC and all the other nonprofit um, and community individuals who are willing to be out there writing grants, doing events. The Earth Day and Arbor Day activities are a good example that collaborative model really works. It doesn't have to all be done by the city. So um, I know planting trees isn't sexy. It's, you know, a lot of work, but um, it's the right thing to do. So I'd ask everybody to consider that as a priority. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Next up is Carrie, followed by Jeff Jax. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for taking comments on this. I'm a resident of Menlo Park, a homeowner, and I have never gotten used to the Caltrain noise. I've lived at my house for 16 years now. The Caltrain noise, and I do mean the horns, has only gotten worse uh, since I've moved in and more growth, more people in Menlo Park. We talked earlier about uh, planning to do that means more trains. It means more noise. And we now virtually have no waking hours, no waking hours without excessively loud, nearly constant horns going off. And when I say that, I mean multiple blasts every five minutes. In my house, you can't talk without hearing the trains going off. Uh, the backyard can't be used, cannot be used for social gatherings, not for birthday parties, not wedding receptions, not neighborhood gatherings. And I've had people, like one gentleman mentioned, in town who've wanted to do that until the first train went by and then watching all of the look on their faces fall, realizing that it could never happen in the backyard because of the train noise. So the train noise affects sleep. Um, like I said, the train noise is going on uh, until late at night. It starts early in the morning. Um, I work from home now, a lot of us do. So working from home in Menlo Park is something that's very important to existing residents and to newcomers uh, moving to Menlo Park. And you can't do that very well with the train uh, horn going off. I have to pause conference calls when it's my turn to speak. It's awkward, it's embarrassing. Um, and the trains make it very difficult to work from home again, which is important. So I'm asking you to, um, to urging you to approve funding for the final stage of making the quiet zone in Menlo Park a permanent reality. I'd say put all the resources that need to be put at this, give it to them. Uh, there is no better way to improve the quality of life in Menlo Park, the value of living in Menlo Park. And that's also from a health and mental health perspective than the opportunity before us to institute a quiet zone. So please, please do that as a top priority. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Our next speaker is Jeff Jacks, followed by Ming T. Good evening. Good evening, City Council and uh, City Council members and, and Mayor. I'm a four year resident of Menlo Park, having moved here from Manhattan four years ago. So let's be clear I am used to city noises. We live in one of the townhouses at the site of the old Rogers Rental, Re, Roger Re, Reynolds nursery sites on Ensignal Avenue. And I will say that we have not gotten used to in four years the incessant horns ringing both at the gates and by the train. In the time that we have been on this call, this meeting, about three hours, I have heard the trains pass by and the horns ring about 19 times. It is a pervasive part of daily living. And as the prior commenter commented, for somebody who is uh, running business or doing conference calls or Zoom calls from work, you are constantly muting and unmuting, especially during the day. 
it is beyond a nuisance. And the decibel ratings are quite high as a, as a prior speaker in the room uh, commented. I'm a physician entrepreneur and the father of two students at Menlo Park City Schools. My eldest is on the autism spectrum. Both of my boys are awakened multiple times at night and I have to come and comfort them and put them back to sleep. We are now running fans, air conditioning and white noise machines constantly to help them with the noise and help them to be able to uh, sleep well so that they are ready in the morning to go to Encinal and to uh, Hillview. Um, I'm, uh, the cost of the project is not mutually exclusive to supporting the other projects that we have on the slate, nor is it, as one commenter uh, mentioned, mutually exclusive to supporting the needs of the undomiciled who live in our city. These are things that improve quality of life, the well-being of life, and I strongly encourage the city council and the mayor to support this move. It is critical to those of us that are within hearing of the trains. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. So next up is Ming T followed by Kyle Snyder. Ming, you should be able to enable your microphone at this time. It does look like you are off mute. However, we're unable to hear you at this time. Uh, so Ming, I'm gonna come back to you. Um, hopefully we can get that resolved. I'm gonna go to Kyle Snyder, and then I will return to Ming T. Good evening, can you all hear me? Yes, go right ahead. Good evening, uh, good, uh, Mayor and, and Council members, appreciate uh, the time and, and residents and, and other community members in Menlo Park. Uh, my name is Kyle Snyder. Uh, I work for Presidio Bay Ventures, uh, who manages the Springline project. And, um, you know, certainly want to uh, echo the the comments that have that have been made uh, by everyone else so far uh, in support of the Quiet Zone initiative. Uh, and then one of the things that I wanted to maybe phrase this issue in a different light as is is how noise pollution can support the city of Menlo Park's broader uh, environmental sustainability and governance goals or, or ESG goals. Um, in one of the prior city council meeting, it was brought up. Um, Kind of, kind of what the status update is as it relates to the City of Menlo Park's initiatives on reducing the carbon footprint. Um, the United Nations uh, in 2022 released a report basically saying that the uh, that noise pollution is now uh, considered a, a, a global, you know, a global environmental uh, issue as opposed to, you know, kind of a, a local nuisance issue. Uh, and so I think. Uh, framing it in in that way, and that the United Nations is is starting to pay attention to the issue of noise pollutions in urban areas, uh, is another way to to consider uh, additional support and funding uh, for this project. Uh, thank you all for your time. Thank you for your comment. So I'm going to be returning to Ming. Hi, can, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Thank you. Great. great. Hi, City Mayor and Council members. And thanks for the opportunity to, to um, speak here tonight. My name is Ming, one of the residents in the Marquis community next to the Encino train crossing. Uh, we've all known by now that back in 2007, the FRA, the Federal Railroad Administration, granted legislation for cities across the country to enact quiet zones uh, for reasons of alleviating horns caused uh, noise pollutions. Uh, as population densities increased in cities across the nation. It's the same that we're facing here in Menlo Park. Uh, being well aware of this rule, many of the affected residents in Menlo Park have been pushing for establishing the quiet zone, and most recently in 2000, 2020 and 2021. Uh, in addition to business and, and uh, commercial activities, we're talking about 1,000 households, uh, close to three, 4,000 Menlo Park residents along the two-mile corridor, which is about 10 or 15% of the city residents, they're constantly being bombarded with the train horns, many of which are 
being sounded at legal loudest levels as mentioned by many of the previous uh, commenters. I think we've all seen by now, <clears throat> just in the last two years, hundreds of public comments at many of the uh, city council meetings uh, begging for the establishment of the quiet zone. Uh, yet it still seems as if our comments and beggings are not loud enough, not quite loud enough like the Caltrain horns. And here's what I'd like to propose is I'd like to kindly invite council members or anyone in opposition to come and stay in our guest room for one night as an opportunity to experience and decide whether using horns in this day of age is still the ideal safety tool that should be used in Menlo Park. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Our next speaker is Mark Cohen, followed by Pam Jones. Good evening, <clears throat> Mayor and Council and staff and members of the public. My name is Mark Cohen. I live in Park Forest with a front view, front row view of Caltrain and a, um, a very loud audience as well. I support the um, prioritizing of the quiet zone project. I wanted to amplify two things that previous commenters said. First of all, as a, a retired developmental pediatrician, uh, it is can be terrifying for a child or an adult with autism to be subject to constant loud noises. Um, and uh, just as a retired pediatrician, dealing, trying to help parents help their children get to sleep, as all of us know who had children trying to get to sleep, uh, the noise can be unbearable. Uh, I also learned at the information session that, uh, that I attended uh, some months ago that there is really an important safety issue that one of the other commenters mentioned that I can understand as if I were a train operator, have, knowing that people are killed by, by railroad trains, that I would want to sound my horn as often as possible to eliminate any possibility that someone could get hurt. The whole purpose of the quiet zone is not just to stop the horns, it's to prevent the cars from crossing the track, to make it impossible for the cars to cross the track so that it is a, it's not just a personal um, health and uh, annoyance issue, it is a safety issue. Um, so I strongly urge you to give this a priority. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. So next up is Pam Jones, followed by Rachel Kennedy. Thank you, and good evening again, Council. <clears throat> um, my, my, I have a question, really, and that is, who is going to pay for um, the <clears throat> for all of this? Is the money? <clears throat> excuse me. Is the money coming from the general fund, or is there just, or is there money that was put aside from one of the development agreements that will pay for it? The reason I'm asking that question is because in my mind, um, I'm thinking there should be some kind of quiet zone special tax district so that the funding will come by those uh, come from those that are affected by it. Um, you know, the type of thing that, is, that was similar to the redevelopment um, agency funding, um, because that was through tax dollars. Um, and we don't even know how much we we're still paying on that one. But that's another topic. Um, so it's not about whether or not they, they, we should have these, the cross, crossings taken care of and reduce noise pollution. I, I appreciate that. And I never would have bought a home there just because of that. But I appreciate that, um, that people are really passionate about this and want to make a safe change. So thank you. Thank you for your comment. Uh, Rachel Kennedy, it looks like you may have put your hand down. Uh, please do re-raise that if you wanted to provide comment on item J1. And this will also be the final call for public comment on our regular business item J1. Seeing no further hands or cards. Oh, apologies, one extra hand. 
Looks like ANSI MAC. Hello? Yes, go right ahead. Yes, my name is Ann Coulthard. Just for all the various reasons listed above, I would like to see strong consideration of maintaining the uh, quiet zone. I happen to live across the street, but a lot of times I keep my windows closed. But for I just, I would like to say as a taxpayer, I would like to see the city council improving our quality of life, not just people who live right nearby the trains, but around it, people who play at the parks, people who are in the libraries. So that's my comment. Thank you for your comment. All right, our final speaker will be Melissa Mills. Thanks so much. I know a lot of um, things have already been said, but I felt impelled to um, compelled to uh, to speak up as well. Thank you so much. I'm a supporter. Thank you for the this forum. I'm a supporter of the quiet zone. I moved um, at the 10 year anniversary of living in my wonderful home in Felton Gables. And I remember standing in my driveway being like, I don't mind trains. And I have to say, it's been 10 years of some really serious sleepless nights. I laid my head on my pillow and I fell asleep my very first night and I was woken up multiple times and I went, oh my goodness, what have I done? And so someone made the comment, I never would have moved there. And you know, it's not that easy to move <laughs> once you've made a life for yourself and tried to soldier through. And so I would just really um, would appreciate uh, continuing to move forward with this because it would make such a difference for my quality of life and so many of my neighbors. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you for your comment. Saying no for their hands or cards. Mayor Willison, you may continue. Thank you very much, City Clerk Karen. And thank you to everyone who spoke this evening on various topics. And thank you also to the members in the audience who didn't speak, but who rose um, to show your support for one of our agenda items. Um, of course, everyone is always welcome to comment. Um, it does help us get to council discussion and decision faster um, to organize like that. So it is, Ms. Goldberg, thank you for having um, folks do that. Um, I also want to acknowledge that there are about 15, it's changing a little, about 15 people on Zoom um, with a label saying quiet zone supporter. So I did just want to uh, point that out. So um, with that, um, so uh, Ms. Warner, can you please, or Ms. Um, Heron, uh, remind us exactly what direction you're seeking from council tonight as we begin our discussion. You can just put that up um, on the screen for a moment, and then I'll be turning it over to my colleagues for their questions and comments. So as that gets pulled up, does anybody, um, actually uh, council member Dorr, I, she wanted to comment before public comment and I told her it had to wait. And so you've been very patient. So please, why don't you kick us off? Sure, thank you. Um, I do wanna turn back to slide 13 and the conversation around the quiet zone about it in the slide, it, it mentioned the design of the grade crossings for all four. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I thought in the council conversation, we said that we would prefer to prioritize on just two of those. In which case, as I think one of the commenters suggested, would that mean less money going towards the design and the study of that? Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Hugh Louch, Assistant Public Works Director for Transportation. So um, designing for two would be it's roughly half of the cost, of the total cost. Um, and there is already the three, roughly $300,000 um, from the Springline development that's that's available for that. So it's four to 450, uh, roughly, for the total cost. For the two, for, for, de, uh, for Oak Grove and two. Ravenswood. Yeah, that's that's the estimate that we have right now. Okay, thank you. Excuse me, but everybody here is talking about. Oh, excuse me, sir. Thank you. Um, sorry, so sir. You ignore Ensemble. Sir, our this council situation. decorum is to um, not yeah, allow public not comment. Not, this um, is not being discussed. That's what everybody here is for. Uh, no council member Dorr, please. Yeah. Um, could our transportation director come help clarify in the dais? Um, I think it'd be helpful just for everyone to clarify that 
why we were focusing on on two. Uh, please, thank you. Yeah, thank you for that. And let me move this. Uh, so the quiet zone, there is no ability to establish a quiet zone for a limited number of crossings. Our crossings are all very close together and any quiet zone has to cover all of the crossings. However, the Federal uh, Railroad Administration rules would allow us by improving two crossings to establish that quiet zone that would then apply to all four crossings and, and the pedestrian crossing at the station. Um, so the, the difference is really whether or not we're uh, making improvements at all four crossings initially or making improvements at two crossings. Um, the only two crossings we can make improvements at to get the quiet zone are Ravenswood and Oak Grove. The other crossings because of having lower traffic volumes, uh, lower uh, incidence of uh, past collisions and things like that would not qualify us to have a quiet zone alone. You have to do the, the busier crossings. Uh, so you have to do Ravenswood and Oak Grove if you're doing just two. So by doing just those two, you could still get the quiet zone throughout Menlo Park. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so actually what I'd like to do is have each uh, council member have an opportunity to ask their questions. Why don't we first go around and ask any questions um, and then if you want to start um, sharing thoughts, that's fine too. Um, so council member Dora, is there anything, any other questions you had or did you want to say anything else? Okay, I see council member Combs, were you looking to say something? Yeah, so a question, I'll keep it to a question. Um, uh, just so, so the additional, if you can go back to the slide uh, with the, the money, the money slide. Um, so the uh, 550,000 in new funding, am I to understand that that comes from the downtown amenity fund? And, and so not general funds. Thank you for the, the question, Councilmember Combs, Nikki Nagaya, Deputy City Manager. And yes, that's correct. We're, what we had proposed was to um, allocate that funding from the Downtown Amenity Fund. Um, I know there was some discussion about that at the last council meeting. That was the best source that we found available funding in that amount. But as, as we've discussed tonight, we could potentially scale the design uh, and look for a smaller dollar amount as well. And so um, you've got the roughly 300,000 already. So you wanna add another 550. My math is right, that comes to $850,000. Um, what does that get you? How far along the train tracks, to use a pun, does that get us? Uh, so the, the full amount, the 850, gets us design for all four crossings to install uh, four quadrant gates at all four of the um, at-grade uh, crossings we have now. Okay. And is one final question, is that staff's recommendation that we put ourselves in a position to do quad gates at all four crossings? What I would say is that I, I think um, it's going to it's going to take a, a matter of time to implement this. And it's going to be a very expensive project from a staff perspective. I think we're open to starting with two. We could always phase that design over multiple years um, as well. Um, so it, you know, understanding there are many many needs and priorities, but we don't necessarily uh, have a opinion about doing that. There's a little bit of convenience of like. We're going to work with Caltrain. We're going to have an agreement. We'll do all four. Maybe that makes staff life a little bit easier, but it's not enough to um, sort of guide that decision. Okay. And just as you're right, a final question. And when you talk about possibly phasing the design, um, that that phasing is a two and two. But once you get to a critical juncture with regards to the two, then you start construction, right? Or, or you go down that path. You don't it's not phase the two, get to the design completion, and then like, oh, then we're going to start designing the other two while nothing happens with the two you initially, um, you, you and because I assume you're going to prioritize, prioritize if we go to this phasing, the two that get you to quiet zone, right? I would recommend that. Yes. <laughs> that um, is a staff recommendation, right? Yes. Yeah. So we absolutely, and again, contingent on a much larger amount of funding could move those two presumably into construction while then 
even at the same time working on design for the next two. All right, thanks. Uh, Council Walker, do you have any questions on any of the other CIP items? I don't have any questions. I have some observations um, and, and direction on, on others, but no, no questions. Okay, thanks. Let's go finish with our questions. Um, Council Member Nash. So my first question is um, the downtown amenity fund was not and it was not designed to do the quiet zone. So I'm wondering what other funds we might have to do the quiet zones, realizing that this was um, you said that this was a good size, but I'm reading from the downtown specific plan. The downtown, um, the public amenity fund was to improve pedestrian bicycle amenities and overall street character of the downtown and station area and to improve and leverage existing downtown public parking plazas. So I don't see this really fitting into it. And my concern is that one of our priorities is activating downtown and economic development. And so it seems while I did hear some good arguments that um, this does affect some of the economic development. I'm wondering if there is a better or another um, pot of money that we could be using. Yeah, thank you, Councilmember Nash, and recognize that the original intent of the Downtown Amenities Fund was, was exactly as you described from the Downtown Specific Plan. I think the connection that we saw was um, in relationship to then the, the contribution from Springline and um, the connection to um, the benefits that the downtown couldn't enjoy from, from the quiet zone establishment as well. And that was part of the staff recommendation. I think the other option for funding for the, the quiet zone would be to look at general capital funds. Um, the, the other specific um, funding sources that we have uh, for, for capital needs are really specific to street paving like gas taxes or transportation impact fees where you have a, a nexus study that provides a connection between a certain scope of improvements and the, the fee program. Uh, but there, there really is not another funding source that's not general capital that we could look at for, for establishment of the quiet zones. And that was part of the staff recommendation for uh, informing why we um, recommended downtown amenities. We would then need to look for, in the case that you wanted to pursue just two crossings and that kind of a, additional funding, we'd be looking for $100,000 to $150,000 more. We'd need to pull that from another project that's proposed uh, in the list for next year in order to, to maintain a balanced budget. So I think that's the, the trade-off that we have to make um, as part of the direction we'd be seeking tonight. We, we're happy to do either way, um, but we um, would need to, to prioritize the, the other projects that we move forward uh, that have general capital dollars proposed. And if, um, I know there's several other projects which are also pulling from the public amenity fund. I'm assuming that you have, um, that there is enough money for all of the projects that are currently in the CIP that are pulling from the public amenity fund. Yes, that's correct. The other project right now that's tapping that those dollars is the downtown streetscape improvement project and uh, there was funding set aside right now that's supporting the street closures on Santa Cruz Avenue and some of the, the temporary improvements that, that are related to the parklet program. Um, so that's the the primary use of the funding right now, there's about uh, $2.2 million uh, from the contributions that the development agreements have uh, provided to um, the downtown amenities fund. So we'd be tapping part of that balance for, for this amount. And if we decide to, um, presumably not this year because it's not part of the CIP plan um, right now, but um, if we need more money downtown to do some of the improvements there and have exhausted the money with um, on the quiet zone, where would we be able to get the money or would that delay the other project? The, the other project being the downtown streetscape or just the overall items? Downtown streetscape or anything downtown. else that is comes up. It's obviously um, with activating downtown as one of our priorities, there is a good chance that we will be trying to do something down there that will cost money. Yes, absolutely. And I think that's part of the, the balancing act. I, I think the primary sources for downtown improvements um, like um, streetscape enhancements, beautification efforts, uh, things that could lead to improved vibrancy 
are also the downtown amenities fund and the general capital fund, in addition to, to looking for grants that can leverage those dollars and, and multiply them. Um, so I think those are, they're really drawing from the same pot of options. And that's part of the, the challenge of prioritization that, that we are asking for, for your feedback on tonight. And as was mentioned, um, possibly having some sort of quiet zone special um, assessment district, what are the possibilities there? Yes, yeah, so I, I believe that came up uh, a bit during the um, uh, council's deliberation on this on April 25th. So I think it's something we could certainly explore further. Um, we would then uh, wanna come back to you with some recommendations about how to proceed, what that, that cost would look like, um, how to uh, engage with some financial analysis uh, to, to determine that the benefits um, um, outweigh the, the cost uh, in the short term. Um, Typically, we see, I think, um, assessment districts for um, improvements that are potentially more than, so the, um, move back up just a second, the construction cost for the two crossings that we were talking about earlier at Ravenswood and Oak Grove that would enable the uh, implementation of a quiet zone is roughly $4 million. And so I think what the analysis we'd be wanting to do is to make sure that the establishment of an assessment district for um, the revenue of $4 million is, is actually a, a cost benefit because there is a, a certain amount of administration that, that's required. And um, I think we typically see improvement districts and assessment districts for funding amounts larger than that, but we we want to do a little more analysis for to move forward. Thank you. So this um, there's $6 million in the plan, 24 to 28 requests. So possibly less, again, if we just do two of the Correct. Crossings. Correct. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Um, a couple other questions in that are um, on the police radio replacement. Is that something that's um, available from basically there's $300,000 there. Um, is that something where that money would be available to a quiet, the, the quiet zone if we were in fact able to um, fund that from one of the special law enforcement funds or is this not possible so as i understand it i think chief norris is on on, on standby and can potentially help answer some questions on this as well um but as i understand it they they've been monitoring and looking for grant opportunities to help offset the cost the, to the general capital dollars um the first phase of radio equipment was purchased this fiscal year uh, they're looking at uh, phasing the remaining purchases over the next two fiscal years in order to help um, uh, make sure we can move forward with a number of different projects. So yes, the next year they're looking for about $300,000 and the following year, 350 uh, to complete the full transition to new equipment. Um, and let me see if um, Chief Norris is and so here. There is an effort to go to look at grants for that. And yes, that's correct. And here is here is Chief North. Yeah, I, I think Nikki explained it very, very well. So uh, unless you have any further questions on this, I'm I, happy to answer anything else that you might have. No, I agree that it, it was explained well. Thank you. Okay. Great, thank you. So on um, number 50, the El Camino Real crossing improvements currently says tier three. Is that a, um, I'm surprised that's not higher given that I think we're working on it. And is that something that we, do you need feedback on that or not? So I think, yes, we are happy to take feedback on any of the, the tier ratings that you see in the attachments. Um, the El Camino Real crossings, I think um, the, the tier representation is one that we use to prioritize work efforts uh, internally for staff. Um, in that case, um, I think the, that that is a pretty accurate assessment of, of the current priority. Um, it does not mean that the projects that are rated tier three are not advancing, um, but in the context of this case, uh, the, like the individual who's working on that project is also working on some active 
uh, projects in construction, and he was also instrumental in helping respond to uh, traffic signal outages during the storms earlier this year. And so those were his, his primary priorities. And so we use that assessment um, to try and, and juggle workload. But, I, but the I crosswalks are, are moving ahead. They are still moving Perfect. ahead. Thank you. Three. Correct. That's, those are my questions. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Nash. Council Member Taylor, uh, Vice Mayor Taylor, questions. Thank you, Mayor Willison. And, and since we are still talking about the, the quiet zone, um, I, I would be interested in knowing if there are any, any current impact fees that can also contribute um, to the funds that are needed. So just thinking about a combination of sources, whether it's a special district impact fees, TOT potentially, um, just thinking about how we can we can actually fund it. Yes, that is a great question. Um, and unfortunately, the impact fees that we have established for various different types of topics, whether transportation impacts or um, uh, housing, uh, the construction street impact fee, those require uh, what's called a nexus study to establish the fee amount. And if the um, individual project is not in the nexus study, then that is not an eligible use of those funds. And so I think the one that would probably by topic area be most likely to have a, a connection would be the transportation impact fee. A, a quiet zone uh, was not contemplated at the time we established the last transportation impact fee. And so it would not be an eligible use of that fund. Um, we could look in the future at a revision to the transportation impact fee at the right time as a source to potentially look for funding for construction, uh, but in the short term for design uh, wouldn't be an eligible source. Um, so the, the well, my understanding is the design funds are, are the easier pot of money. It's the construction. So while we fund the design, we can revise the TIF so that it does include uh, that that's correct. Um, the the one caveat I will mention is that we'll take time and, and resources as well. So we'll, we'll need to fund a study to revise the TIF. Um, so if that's something that you're interested in tonight, we can take that direction and, and look at how to proceed uh, with that in the future um, as part of the, the recommendations. I, I appreciate that. And, and also TOT as well. Would we need to do a study for that as well to determine if we could allocate funds so differently? TOT is, is part of the funding that uh, rolls up into the general fund. So uh, that is essentially a, a use of the general capital dollars, which come from the, the general funds as well. And um, my last question, and this is specific to the quiet zone, is just, so it, it's my understanding that the council, based on our funds and the fund policy that was created by the council, that the council could allocate funding if they had support of the majority of the council. So as you stated earlier that the downtown fund, the downtown fund, um, the amenities fund can only be used for something specific, but if the majority of the council wanted to use the funds for something different, they wouldn't be able to do that? Um, I'm sorry if I, I may have, um muddied the waters a little bit there. The, the council has discretion to, to use um, general fund, general capital dollars, the downtown amenities funds for, for things at the discretion of the council. I think what I was responding to earlier, um, the council member Nash had read was the description from the downtown specific plan, which uh, described the inspiration for the funds and, and where they would be uh, seen to be used in the future. And at that time that the specific plan was adopted in, in 2012, uh, I don't think we were talking about a quiet zone uh, at that point in time. So I uh, wouldn't, wouldn't be surprised that that wasn't specifically mentioned in the, the downtown plan. But I think, um, I, don't, I do not know of any particular policy or um, regulation that guides the council uh, that would preclude you from using the downtown amenities funds uh, for this purpose uh, tonight. Okay. Thank you. And if there are any other questions, go ahead. That inspired some more questions from me. Um, so a question on, do we have any ballpark sense of 
how how much time and how many resources resources would it take to do that study to revise the TIF and and look at that impact fee? Um, not tonight, but we we could put something together. Um, we, the last time we updated the transportation impact fee was in 2018. A best practice recommendation is that you do that every seven to ten years. So we're coming up on that horizon. Um, we're we're at the five year mark right now. Um, but I think um, in the context of uh, developing the, the capital plan, that's also something we could look at putting in a future uh, fiscal year of the, the CIP uh, to kind of set the stage for, for that update in the future as well. Thank you. We also heard from someone who shared a letter from, I think, five hotels. And I'm curious if there's a way that the TOT could be increased uh, given the potential benefit to downtown hotels over others in the area? If that's a great question, that may be something that um, to look to either the city manager, assistant city manager, or something we could come back to you with in the future. So through the mayor, are you looking for a, a little update uh, on TOT? Yes, if yes, you want so, to, I don't know if that's yeah, um, <laughs> we, we would definitely want to follow up, but just for people's general benefit, uh, if there is a desire by the city council to increase um, TOT transit occupancy tax, that would require um, it to be placed on the ballot. And so that, that's a multi-step process. So it's um, um, if there is direction, I, I think there's already a, a request from the council for staff to follow up with various uh, revenue options for the city. So that's already kind of uh, on, on the plate for us to follow up on. So it's just whether you would want anything more than that at this point in time. Great, thank you, that, that was helpful. I have some other questions not related to the quiet zone, if that's okay. Uh, that's fine. And then I believe Vice Mayor Taylor had some additional questions and then I'll have some questions. I'll turn it back to you, please. So you, please continue. Okay. Um, Get all your questions out. <laughs> okay, so there are some new items on here that said there's a source one that is something and then source two is grant. And I'm curious if you could share a little bit more clarity on what that mix is for some new requests for 2023, 2024. The first one of those is for the electric vehicle chargers at city facilities for um, 970,000. And can you, can you um, let us know what number um, on the list it is? Great question. I only took down the names. So I have to I go find them. I think it's number 14. That helps. That's number 15. 15, sorry, thank you. Thank number 15. You. Yeah. So um, in that particular case, um, the grant incentive that we were looking at is, is just under $100,000 of the, the approximately 975 that we were requesting. And is that including looking at IRA funding and some other the new federal resources that are coming down for EVs? Uh, we we can double check. I'm not sure. If I remember offhand. Yeah, that that particular incentive was from Peninsula Clean Energy, um, but we can double check on the the IRA funds as well. Okay, that's helpful to hear because maybe there could be more funding there. And another one is on the smart irrigation infrastructure, which is number seventeen, with general capital and grant of two hundred and thirty thousand. Yes, yeah, so that uh, we, we are targeting 50% uh, of the funding to be from a, a grant. Um, we had applied for a grant this past fiscal year. We were unsuccessful, but we'd be looking uh, to reapply in a future cycle. And is there something that um, makes us feel more confident about getting that extra 50%? Uh, yes, the feedback uh, from the, the grant agencies, uh, we applied for a water efficiency grant and um, they provided some direction about some other op opportunities, other funding sources within their, their umbrella that may be a better fit. Great, thank you. And then one more on the uh, breakdown, the urban forest master plan, which is number 19. I'm curious how much of that 250. Yes, that one I think we are still looking at, um, as say, in the approximate 50% range, um, but there, uh, I think one of the EQC members that spoke tonight, Mr. Schmidt, um, had, as well as other members of the TREES subcommittee of the EQC have been working um, very, very hard to look for uh, funding, and one potential source is from CAL FIRE that we were tracking closely. Thank you. Um, number one and number eight on the page before this, 
is for the MPCC, the Menlo Park Community Center, and the request for 2023-2024 uh, is TBD. And I'm curious if there's any more insights you could share on those. Yes, so um, in the staff report, we had a brief summary, uh, but the council earlier this year, I think in, in March, uh, took some actions to appropriate some additional funding to MPCC. At that point in time, uh, we had also shared uh, that we were tracking the need for an additional request related to the delays in equipment procurement for the uh, clean energy microgrid, as well as some additional contingency for the project. Um, we think the maximum amount for the microgrid delay is, is in the $1.7 million range, uh, potentially uh, we're hoping much, much lower than that, but um, that's the, the maximum number that we've um, heard from Meta so far. And then the contingency amount is in the, the two to $3 million range. And one last question um, from me, and I can't find it. The uh, the building exterior improvements. Let's see if someone can find it quicker than I can. Number thirteen. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, for that one, for the um, to make the roofs stable enough to have solar and batteries. Um, I notice it doesn't mention any grant opportunities there. Uh, and I'm curious if there might be some that maybe are earlier in the exploratory phase. Yeah, at this point, um, we are tracking grants um, in coordination with PCE, PCE um, for the solar components, but not for the roof replacements. Uh, we can definitely continue to keep our, our eyes and ears out. Um, I point to one other project on the list, uh, number six, uh, the main library roof replacement. Uh, we learned last year that there was a grant through the California State Library Foundation, and so we were able to mobilize to secure funding. Uh, that's about 50% of that project. So there may be opportunities in the future, um, but they're typically designed and, and geared towards um, types of the type of building uh, like the, the library one would be. Thank you, Council Member Dorr. Um, Vice Mayor Taylor, back to you with your questions. Thank you, Mayor Willison. And, and thank you, staff, for, for having patience with us um, because some questions come up in discussion and which means you didn't get it ahead of time. Um, so my, I'm gonna go to the, actually to the urban um, tree forestry master plan. I just had a, a question. I think the last inventory was done in 2002. So when you, if, when you come back, if you could let us know how many trees there are um, specifically in the Bellhaven neighborhood, I think that was the last time it was done. And I may be wrong because I haven't been able to find any documentation on it. Great, thank you. Um, we do have a, a pretty good estimate of the number of um, public tree planting sites. So the, the street trees and uh, trees in parks. Uh, so that's information we can send over to you um, uh, after the, the meeting tonight. I think if, are you looking though for the total number of trees like including private property as well? Is, is that how the, the tax district is done based on the number of trees a person has at their house or on the street? Yes, good question. Um, so the landscape assessment district, uh, which you will be seeing at your, your next meeting as well, um, uh, in, includes a connection to street tree planting sites. So they're, they're the publicly maintained, uh, city owned, city maintained trees. Thank you. And I'm what I'm trying my best to do is actually go down the list. So starting off with the city building with questions. Um, one that has come up multiple times and on here, it the cost is around $60,000 and that is the, the gatehouse fence repair. Um, I am supportive of it. I'll just say that now. <laughs> it is definitely needed. Um, Going to, let's see, the climate action plan, the community-wide. I don't see a dollar. 
Oh, I'm sorry, number 14. And I don't see a dollar amount on there, so I'm not sure. It's operation. So this item number 14 would come as a, a budget item, is my guess. Uh, yeah, so traditionally this has been a um, line item that's funded in the capital plan, but the scope of the type of work that's um, planned to be done next fiscal year is really more programmatic in nature, um, more policy work, more, more programs, and isn't necessarily constructing something like you would fund in a typical capital pro project. And so we're proposing to um, shift that, that funding amount to the operating budget as opposed to itemizing it in the CIP. So there's still proposed funding to support implementation of CAP activities, uh, but just in a different place in the city's budget uh, going forward. Thank you. Uh, my next question is on 16. Uh, which is the the one shoreline. So this just covers the membership fee. Yes, that's correct. So it's not a capital improvement. Yes, that's that's right. And and I know that there are some gaps in the in the reach. Um, so I'm just putting it out there. If it, there's any potential in 2024 to apply for a brick grant specifically for the shoreline. And I know that there's already a brick grant in motion, but that's just for the PG&E substation. So um, yes, we, if so that's possible. We can continue to look for, for grant opportunities for um, shoreline protection. The brick grant that the city was notified of, of award um, is for this section of the shoreline, roughly from uh, Bedwell Bayfront Park to um, the the pg e substation. So it, it stretches, um, it's about 75% of the Menlo Park shoreline, uh, but there still remain gaps both on the uh, northern end, uh, closer to Redwood City, as well as the southern end. And my, my directions are not geographically accurate, um, but I think, um, you know, generally where I'm talking about. Um, uh, closer to East Palo Alto, so we we are looking to can looking to continue to search for grants for those gaps. Um, our success rate at a second brick application um, may be questionable, but we can certainly uh, try to to pursue that. Thank you, I appreciate it. And then uh, the next one I think I already talked about is the the urban forest master plan. Um, I'm definitely supportive of Mr. Smith's comments. Um, and I'm glad to see that it's that it's on here. Um, and a question about Betwell Bayfront Park, the entrance, this is number 22. It says that it's on hold. I thought this was covered under a DA. So I don't know if the hold is, I'm assuming the hold is not funding it, that there's another reason. Correct. The, the hold was not funding. Um, it's both um, looking at the scope of that project to make sure we adapt to sea level rise and staffing constraints uh, in our utilities section. And, and is the entrance a part of the 25% that's not covered? Yes, it is. Okay. That's correct. And we, we've had active conversations with, with One Shoreline and um, some other partners about options there. Uh, they, they just need a little bit more design and due diligence so we can hopefully find the appropriate grant sources to proceed. Thank you. I have a, a couple more comments. Um, but if you wanna to go to somebody else while I search for them, you sure? And just as a side note, I've, I've gotten some questions about the park ranger. So the one that's supposed to cover, I think part of Bedwell Bayfront and part of Kelly Park. Um, folks don't think that they exist and I know they do. So I'm just, just a side note. And for right now, Mayor Willison, that's all the questions I have at the moment. Thank you, Vice Mayor Taylor. You'll definitely have another opportunity to speak. Um, okay, so uh, my turn for questions. Um, so it sounds like even though some of the money is 
being shown that needs to come from general capital, there remains a possibility that there could be grant funds identified. And so we could end up not dipping as much, but we're being conservative here and safe. And because that's not a sure thing, we're indicating that the funds are coming from general funds. Is that correct? So where we know or have grants already um, uh, approved or awarded, those are accounted for in the, the dollar amounts that you see. Um, I think with with um, things like police radios and some of the, the building exterior improvements, we can continue to look for, for funding um, from grants. I, I can't say with any amount of certainty that those dollars will come through. Um, and so in those cases, we've budgeted for the amount of funds we think we'd need, and we can continue to look for, for grants going forward. Just, just so I have a sense, in prior years, um, in situations like this, um, when we hope to, that there might be grants possible, what's the hit rate on that typically? Um, so I think we probably have the most, there, there are the most opportunities in um, uh, traditionally in things related to transportation. So I think you, and you'll see this in the, the, the charts and the tables, um, those grant funding sources where we've been successful, I think are a little more predictable. There have been such, there has been such an infusion though of federal dollars through the, inf um, the jobs and infrastructure acts that those I think are still emerging programs. And so that's where you're hearing less confidence, I think, in the likelihood of being able to obtain funding from those sources because they're new and because the program guidelines haven't all been established for those programs yet. Um, so where um, we may have good estimates of hit rates from prior years, I, I don't know that those even apply as we pivot to um, looking at the, the federal dollars coming, coming up. Um, thank you. And on items, forty and forty one, these are the parking plaza renovations. So um, we have we're using the downtown parking permits to fund work on two of the parking plazas in the total amount for the upcoming year of two, $2 million, 400,000. Um, we just heard a very inspiring presentation tonight about putting affordable housing on parking plazas. Um, is it, uh, what are the, is that, um, it, what is staff planning to do in this coming fiscal year on those plazas? And when will staff be making a decision um, given the feasibility study we're gonna be doing uh, for affordable housing downtown? So um, the downtown parking permit funds have supported the maintenance of the downtown parking plazas and infrastructure downtown. Uh, as you know, the downtown parking enforcement has been um, lax for now a number of years kind of post pandemic. So we're not collecting any new revenue related to parking permits right now. The fund balance that we have in that fund will essentially cover the um, cost to resurface the two parking plazas that are shown in the CIP set seven and eight. And those have been shown for a number of years now because the, the pavement is, is in poor quality. And so I think we were uh, planning to start the design work um, on the plazas um, in this coming fiscal year. We know that there's coordination needed with the work related to um, exploring housing options downtown. Uh, but as you heard from the, the student presentations tonight, the soonest that they were identifying housing being constructed is 2028. And so I think we will be wanting to make sure that the pavement will last until the time that housing could potentially come online. And I, I think uh, based on the, the time, typical timelines for construction, I think we're gonna need to pave those plazas uh, in even before any housing might be put in place. Thank you, but it doesn't sound like other than potential design work, there's gonna be any major, cause it's showing here over $2 million for capital work for this coming year. 
Correct. That that was allocated in a, a prior fiscal year and will will it would carry over. So the two hundred thousand dollar estimate was the design cost, and the two million was the construction, like order of magnitude. Thank you. And then um, the downtown parking permit money. I completely understand what it is being planned to be used for. Some of the items um, that Council Member Nash read off from the Downtown Amenity Fund needing um, for our downtown revitalization, um, would it be within the realm of possible expenditures for the Downtown Parking Permit Fund to appropriate, would it be appropriate if that money were used if we were to kind of borrow some of the Downtown Amenity Funds for the Quiet Zone um, to start moving, I'm trying to move money around here. Um, can, can, could that money potentially be used for some of the items that were mentioned? If we want to kind of- For streetscape and other improvements downtown? Yes. Um, this is a good question. I think we're gonna have to do a little bit of digging to, to go back to the actual kind of enabling um, uh, documents, just double check a couple sources. It hasn't been used that way in the past, but I don't know if there's anything that would prevent it from being used in that way, but okay. we can we can look into that. Thank you. Um, so if we take any, if we need any more general funds, then our, then $5 million basically, um, then we have to start making trade-offs, it sounds like, unless we want to go over the 5 million appropriation, which has its own set of ripple effects with our budget and financial situation. Correct. So the, the options would be to not move forward with projects that are identified for new requests for next year and, and kind of trade something in its place um, to look at uh, reducing uh, carryover amounts for projects that are already funded. Um, we, we've done some of that exercise already um, where we know we're not going to need funding um, this coming year uh, made made some proactive changes. We've also closed out a number of projects this year and, and that uh, remaining funding will roll back to the fund balance. That's where that extra 2 million in the $5 million balance comes from. The example was Sharon Road sidewalks. I think we had roughly $70,000 left in the balance. And so that rolls back to the, the fund balance and then gets reappropriated to projects. Um, and then yes, the, the last thing you mentioned would be doing a larger transfer, but that has trade-offs with the overall um, operating budget. And given the, the constraints, so not necessarily be staff's recommendation for, for the year ahead. So does staff have, has staff already identified um, potential projects to underfund or delay funding if we did not want to use the downtown amenities fund for the quiet zone? Are there recommendations that you have? Uh, we do not have that recommendation tonight. If that's the council direction, what I would suggest is, is we can take that, we can go back and, and look for um, uh, a $150,000 amount and bring that forward as part of the CIP that, that you would consider as part of the budget. Um, so that's direction we could take tonight. And to clarify, when you say $150,000, that would be kind of foregoing the idea of doing all the design work at once for the four crossings and only doing the design work for the two to, to get going. Correct. Okay. And that, that um, I, I will make a recommendation in, in this context. Uh, I think trying to find $550,000 um, in, we'll say re reductions in other places for um, funding the design of all four crossings, I know is going to be a big challenge. We, I have a little more confidence that we could find the 150 um, if if that's the direction of the council uh, tonight. But it, it may be pulling from a project that had already been funded in a prior year um, instead. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Um, Shifting gears um, for a moment um, onto item 50, which is the El Camino Real improvements. 
Uh, bear with me for just a moment. So um, we the, the focus of item 50 are the pedestrian crossings. Um, and those are in the works. If um, we, if the council wanted to, uh, given that safety, uh, street safety is one of our council priorities, wanted to look at also some bicycle improvements on El Camino, um, would, how would we be, need to request more money or how would that work? with the CIP, um, is there room to do that? Um, I know there's been discussions in the last 10 years, um, but how would that work with staff capacity um, and funding to accomplish that? Yeah, so uh, thanks for that question. I think that um, my recommendation there would be as a first step, to sort of revisit where we've been uh, with the work that we've done. And, and so I think we'd need to kind of come back to you and, and remind everyone the study, which is now a little bit on the older side, um, the kind of direction that we had. Um, there are a lot of updates, which are, some of which have been mentioned already tonight, uh, up and down the corridor uh, that are happening. So at our immediate neighbors to the south and, and some things to the north, um, and, and then kind of get direction about what we would potentially do. Um, so there was one sort of recommendation that came out of the corridor study, uh, and then a lot has changed uh, in the meantime. And there are things that are relatively easier to do and things that are relatively harder uh, probably to do. Um, and I think we want to kind of understand uh, both sort of the direction to go, but also kind of level of engagement and other factors to sort of scope out what your request would look like. Um, so that, that's, I guess, what I would recommend as a next step. Okay, and I, I'm bringing this up because um, I heard two pieces of information. One that Palo Alto, that Caltrans is going to be repaving El Camino Real in Palo Alto, and that Caltrans is proposing a design that has bike lanes, and that um, Atherton has been pursuing grants to look at eliminating travel lanes to put bike lanes on their side. Um, so I know one of the conversations I believe from many years ago when this was kind of tabled was that let's wait and see what other cities are doing and it's not kind of ripe yet and it it sounds like there might be conversations so um so if we wanted to even because we made some hard decisions I believe last year with regards to the middle plaza opening and there like could be a relatively low-hanging fruit section of El Camino that we could start with let's say between middle and Palo Alto and uh, the Palo Alto border that I think only requires a couple more spots. Um, and then we can have bike lanes there. So um, would that need to be included in the CIP or we could just give alternative direction to staff to come back with, like you said, an update on where we're at with what's going on in this topic? Yeah, I think we'd want direction to bring that back and then we'd want you know more direction on you know, at the, we, like essentially we'd want a study session to review where we've been and then get sort of formal direction on what's next. So it, it, I think it'd be very difficult from my perspective to fit it in this year's CIP, like doing the study session is something that staff could do within our resources, but then in terms of what level of additional study or design or, or one thing or another that would need funding, that that's a maybe a little bit of a separate question. And we'd probably want to have that study session first. Okay, and is the study session, would it bump any other projects or work that the staff is working on? I mean, I think what we'd have to do is time it so that it doesn't. We do have a number of things that are supposed to start or have started or are actively either in construction or, or you know, um, are going to need some outreach this summer and fall. So I think we just want to time it so that it doesn't impact any of those things. But I think, um, you know, it, it's a reasonable thing sometime in the next several months to think about having a study session like that after the budget, obviously. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Louch. Um, let me see if I have any other questions. Um, 
Okay, so I, I'll actually kick it off with some opinions, I guess, to get the, yes, Council Member Nash. Could you go back over the quiet zone costs? The reason why I'm asking is I heard the number 150,000 would be what we were looking for if we didn't do it out of the downtown amenity fund. And what was, could you just review that, please? Sure. Why don't I help with that? So there's an existing 300,000 that came from Springline that I think was put into the downtown amenity fund, but specifically for the quiet zone, right? And then to get to design for two, it's roughly 450,000. And, and we're still waiting on precise estimates from Caltrain because they will ultimately do this work. Uh, but we're estimating based on what we heard from our consultant about 450,000 for the two. Um, so that's where the 150 comes from. So 300, so 150,000 in new funding plus the 300 existing. And so to get the other two zones is another 400,000. I guess that's where I was yeah, tripping up. Approximately. I think we had given a range a little bit. And so the 850 is a little bit like the midpoint of that range of what we think the cost could be. And it is a reasonable uh, cost point for us to work from. In all likelihood, that design will take more than a year. So if it needed a little bit more funding later, that's something that, that could happen um, at a future time. Thank you. All right, but well, before we begin, are there any other questions? Okay, uh, Vice Mayor Taylor. Thank you, Mayor Willison. I am actually this item, it's on an info, is an info item, but it's also, I believe, on the CIP list. I do not know the number, and this is the Willow Road Landscaping. So it's number 59, that should be easy to find. Um, so what, what I would like to say, I was gonna make this comment at, uh, as an info item, but what I would like to one know is how many trees were actually cut down in the project in 2019. Um, two, I would like to know if I have support from the council to actually write a letter to Caltrans about the impact of four years of not having screening. Um, number three, I noticed that there were trees and screening plant on one side of the freeway, but not on the other. So I'd like to see the same done on both sides. So if in your analysis, if you could let us know if we could have a retaining wall, can we have the same screening that's on the other side of the freeway? Um, can we have some trees planted as well? Um, we want the same. Um, and I don't know who had a greater exposure to the freeway. It doesn't really matter, but both sides were impacted. Um, but I'm hoping we can, along with these suggestions, is actually write a letter to Caltrans just about what removing those trees did um, to residents in Mental Park and the four years of being exposed to the freeway, the pollution, and the noise. So thank you. Okay, I, I was actually saving this for my comments, but I, I just wanted to, to chime in. Thank you, uh, Council Member Vice Mayor Taylor for, for kicking it off. And, and I wanna say this to the few folks that are remaining um, for, for the quiet zones. So this is an issue. If you go to the new, um, or relatively new, it's now been, I think four or five years, uh, Willow Road overpass on and off ramps. Um, there was a project to redo that. And as part of that project, dozens and dozens and dozens of mature trees um, that provided all sorts of sound, noise, dust mitigations were taken out. Um, and, and in one case, a, a brick wall, sound wall was replaced with a fence in addition to the fact that um, the mature trees were taken out. And so again, here we had residents in Menlo Park in the Bellhaven side and, and on the Willows Flood Triangle side um, who were, were now seeing significantly uh, uh, a significant decrease in their quality of life based on the increase of sound um, um, as a result of, of the destruction of those, those tree and wall mitigations. And so we have literally been talking about this landscaping plan um, for four years because it was not baked into that project at all. Like, right, as you would think it might, you redo an overpass and you redo the landscaping, but no, it was an entirely separate thing. 
And, and even now what's on the information item says that like, it's gonna be two years before we even get any landscaping. And we're gonna be talking about like not very mature trees. So we're talking about like 10 years out before you get some of the mitigation. And so this is what I say when I talk about um, sort of equi equitability, uh, what is a, a, a problem for me that we have this issue now where it's like, well, we're having all these impacts in connection with, with, with noise and, and with the sound, uh, the, the, the train horns of which I appreciate, I hear the train horns also, but it's, it literally is going to be six years where residents in one part of the city were completely, where they had, you know, their sound mitigation taken away and where they've been completely ignored. And where we were told, or at least for me, it was like there was money budgeted, I think a million and something. And then it was like, oh, we're going to go out for this grant funding. We didn't get the grant funding. And so Council Member Taylor and I at one point were like, okay, well, just let's just go with the money we have. Uh, because all of this sort of going for grant funding, it's going to be like another six or seven years. And so I just want to, so, so this is like an, an and I am very and have been supportive of the, uh, the quiet zone effort. But for me, when I see this dichotomy here, it really makes me feel uncomfortable um, because you have issues of noise for some residents in the city that have been ignored. And then this issue of noise has been, has been sped up. And, 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 and I think, I, I think council member or vice mayor Taylor for kicking this off, but that's a problem. And, and, and that's what we should be talking about, but, but we're not. Um, were there, was there a question or a request? No, as I said, that was my observation. It wasn't a question. I will say though that like Council Member Taylor pointed out that yes, recently, which I very much appreciate, th three trees were, were planted on the flood triangle side. Um, and they're, they're in some years, in 10 years, they will be good mitigation. But yes, I definitely think that, that some trees should be planted um, on, on, on the other side. Although I will say that like you guys have a solid brick wall continuously. We have a fence for uh, a, a large part of, of what separates us from, from, from the freeway. Um, but I am supportive of, of like, again, you know, planting through three trees or whatever. But I also am more supportive of the idea of, of, of really sort of like, I really think it's like not acceptable that it's gonna be like still two years. Um, and so literally we're looking at six to seven years after the overpass was redone before we actually get some beginnings of some mitigations for the sound and noise impact. Um, I want to ask staff or offer staff an opportunity to respond to the, the timing and the process of the Willow 101 project, because I that sounds very frustrating. Um, I, I will start and then um, Deputy City Manager has a longer history with it. And I, I feel like we're bleeding a little bit into the info item here, but uh, maybe just to quickly say, uh, fully respect and understand the frustration um, that that uh, and the time it's taking to do this. Um, my, my understanding um, uh, from a Caltrans perspective is that they always separate the landscaping phase from the interchange uh, redesign projects. That's it's sort of specialized skills and, and they don't ever do them together. Uh, so that's actually quite common. Um, and uh, the timing, uh, you know, that, that we've given so far, I think, it, and we are uh, working hard to get all the bits and pieces in place to make um, that project move as quickly as we can. There is funding, um, as is noted, uh, from the Transportation Authority. Um, there's actually uh, somewhat fortunately some leftover funding from the interstate interchange reconstruction that we can use so that we can replace more trees than were there before. Um, and, and yes, uh, the number of trees that were cut down, I think was all of them. Um, so, uh, but we can get you some specific numbers and there's some that are in the staff report that get into sort of the variance and, and how much is um, is going to be replaced. So uh, we're very hopeful to be in final design on that shortly, that'll come back. Uh, so you can see those final designs and then um, as quickly as we can get that into, uh, into the construction phase, but totally understand and respect that it's been a very long time. The grant, the pursuit of grants 
uh, sort of inevitably probably did add some time uh, to that schedule. Um, but uh, since we've had the direction to move forward on the what's called the sort of standard landscaping plan for Caltrans, that that's what we've been actively working towards and, and working uh, with them on. Um, and, and then just one note. So we were able to plant the trees uh, in our right of way uh, recently, we, we we can't go in and plant trees in the Caltrans right of way uh, without their permission. So um, unfortunately, there's not an exact sort of duplicative location where we could just go as we did sort of at uh, Van Buren and Bay, our maintenance folks did recently and plant those trees. So there's there's a little restriction there. I'll do that. We're, we're very appreciative of, of the trees. Um, and I, I, I noticed them as soon as they, they went up. <laughs> um, I, I will say though, and again, I know that this is, but not very much different than, than, um, as it relates to the quiet zone where we're, we're dealing with Cal train, not Cal trans. And so in both cases, we're, we're dealing with entities, um, that are, 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 are so, sort of the, the major organizers or the primary organizations. So, so again, the, the similarities are, are, are sort of very right. I would only say, and I know this is not you, but uh, totally appreciate that they separate out landscaping and, and actual sort of um, construction projects, but seven years, seven years, that, that's a failure. That's not, a, that's not an operating model. That is a failure that you have one part of what should be essentially a continuous project ends and you actually have the audacity to have like a ribbon cutting ceremony um, um, while the, the landscaping is still uh, like horrific um, and you've paid no attention to it. I know that's not you. I, I... Yeah, and if, if I may through, through the mayor, um, I, yeah, I would totally hear, hear the feedback. I, I think um, the one other thing that we're looking at to try and expedite the, the remaining steps of delivery is looking to partner with the TA as the constructing entity. And so it, as opposed to, so the options would be the city leading construction, the TA leading construction or Caltrans leading construction. And so from a staff resourcing perspective, uh, I think not great for us to lead construction uh, from a schedule perspective, not great for Caltrans to lead construction. And so uh, we're hopeful that the TA being the actual owner of the construction contract is the best of both worlds that minimizes the staff resources, but also uh, sees it through as quickly as possible here, here on out. So that, that's another new development with, with new staff at the TA um, that Mr. Louch has been, been working through as well. I have a follow-up question and, and thank you for that information because I didn't know. Um, one of the concerns that I have is just best practices best practices of, of Caltrans, I and mean, clearly they need to work on that area. Are there the same challenges through the TA? I, I don't think they're the same challenges. I think probably a different set of challenges, but um, not in the context of, of Caltrans. I, I think um, in terms of the, the longer history, uh, we would be happy to follow up and, and have a deeper dialogue on this particular topic. The I think the in hindsight, there was a major pivot point in the Willow 101 interchange when uh, the TA and Caltrans uh, came to the city for the city to be the project sponsor. And I think that shifted roles and dynamics in a way um, that have now led us to where we are today. Um, I think that's probably the the biggest lesson learned in, in, in informing how we want to engage with Caltrans going forward. Um, so again, happy to, to have more conversation and, and dissect this a little bit more in terms of um, lessons learned and, and best practices. I, I think, um, the, and this is not to, to emphasize that this is a best practice, the Broadway interchange in Burlingame was constructed just before Willow Road um, was, and they are also still waiting on landscaping um, as well. So I, I think this is not unique to San Mateo County and maybe maybe a broader discussion that, that's worth um, teeing up at a, a, a different time as well. I appreciate that. I'm, I'm still interested in the letter to Caltrans, um, having something documented from the city um, and the second is, I don't think that the Broadway interchange looks the same way as the 101 
interchange on Willow Road. My side of the freeway looks horrible. It looks horrible. And what I would like to see come back from staff is what full screening looks like. Full screening where there's no gaps. You don't see directly into the 1100 block of Willow Road because you can see into the you can see into their homes. That's what I would like to see come back. Now that we have talked that one, um, I would like to actually bring up the parks. Um, I would like to see some improvements at the parks um, in the Bellhaven neighborhood, um, just for a scope out for um, improvements. Um, we can start off with the Carl Clark Park or the small park at park right next to the freeway on the 1100 block of Willow um, and also the Hamilton Park. Uh, there's, only, there's only a few parks, but anyways, I'd like to add that to the CIP list and then potential funding would be the Community Amenities Fund. Thank you. I have a question on that. Um, thank you, Vice Mayor Taylor. Um, I noticed that there is line item 24 park improvements, parentheses minor, and I'm curious um, what is included on that list and if the parks that Vice Mayor Taylor mentioned might already be included there? Or if not, who, what is included there? Thanks. Yes, so that is funding that typically supports uh, minor maintenance at, at the parks, uh, things like broken playground equipment, uh, replacing mulch um, when uh, the mulch levels uh, decrease um, beyond kind of acceptable safety levels, um, minor fencing repairs uh, around uh, different play areas, playgrounds, um, park, park um, perimeters those types of things. So the, that funding is not a source of typical um, major improvements at, at any of the parks. So if there's a desire to add parks projects, I think, uh, and appreciate Councilmember Taylor identifying a potential funding source, uh, we have um, a small amount of Measure T bonds remaining to be programmed. Um, as well as recreation in lieu fee funds and then the community amenities funds uh, that Councilmember Taylor just referenced um, with a focus on, on District 1. So um, if there are, what would be, I think be helpful tonight is um, identification of anything that's missing from the list and then uh, we'll, we'll likely need to take that back and figure out how it fits into the overall work plan for, for delivery. Is it possible to use a consultant or contractor for some of the work, um, for example, with the public amenity funds or community amenity funds? Would so, that be? Yeah, so we, we do um, often use con contractors, consultants to augment staff capacity, um, depending on the particular topic area and, and type of project. Um, we, we would want to kind of just take a step back and figure out what the most effective way to get somebody who has the proper qualifications and experience and knowledge um, in, in the mix. The, the great thing about consultants is that they can often take a project, uh, a technical project and run with it, but they don't know the community, they don't have the relationships to know which stakeholders to outreach to. And so that still typically is a staff led effort. Um, uh, for for the, that part of the project. Do you have any suggestions how to um, achieve some work faster? One of the things that um, the community has been, we've heard is that there's all these funds that are getting, that are being collected in the community amenities fund. And what are they going to, how do we use them? They're not doing a lot of good just sitting in the fund. Um, people want to see some results. Is there any, do you have any suggestions how we might be able to achieve that faster given that there is this um, special funding source and special interest? So I believe um, the community amenities kind of project list was, was planned to come back to the council shortly. So I think in the context of, of that uh, conversation, um, uh, excuse, it's the, like enabling ordinance and some other other changes. Um, we, we would probably want to um, go back and put our, our heads together more on exactly what um, measures we could take to to deliver those improvements. Um, 
but at, at this point in time, the community amenities funds aren't programmed in the CIP uh, because I think the, the types of projects haven't yet been identified. So that's really the first step. And then we can um, work towards the actual delivery and implementation. These parks, I believe, are on the old, on the existing community amenities fund, um, if that's helpful. The existing list. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yes, that's helpful. Thank you. Okay. Um, I think we're going to move on now to, I think we're at the point now where we need to um, give our direction to staff. So I'm going to go ahead and start. Um, council member, okay. <laughs> um, so I, um, Oh, that was a lot. Um, okay, I'm just take a deep breath for a second. So lots happening in the city. Um, it's exciting to see so many projects um, in the pipeline for 23-24. Looking forward to getting that budget through so we can see these come to fruition. Um, did you need me? Yes. Okay. Um, Regarding safe streets, um, I wanted to start with the fact that there is obviously a lot of development happening and in the pipeline to happen on El Camino and Willow Road. Um, these are also um, two of our highest collision corridors for people in all modes, especially pedestrians and cyclists. Um, we also have major projects on El Camino and Willow and the TMP um, listed as tier one projects. Um, and I'm excited to see the CIP uh, projects um, that uh, I know I mentioned number 50 about El Camino Real with the pedestrian crossings and that there's some CIP project um, 41 Willow and Newbridge. And I know that staff has been um, working on Willow Road um, with uh, high visibility crosswalks painted um, signal phasing work, part of Bellhaven traffic calming, I believe is gonna be implemented starting in the summer. Um, and Caltrans um, was adding a buffer to the bike lanes. Um, so I think it's really exciting on Willow Road that we're getting that to be more of a complete street. Um, I do want to, um, I'm interested in directing staff um, as I discussed with Mr. Louch to come back um, with a study session um, on the El Camino Real bike lanes. Um, as I mentioned, I think given that safe streets is a council priority and um, our emphasis on really trying to make our streets safe for all users and the movement that we're seeing um, both north and south of us, um, if there's some low hanging fruit we can do, I think um, we, we should move on that. Um, so I'm seeking um, some support to um, have that study session if I need that. Um, and then regarding the funding, so I think the big, um, it's not really an elephant, I guess it's the train in the room, <laughs> is the quiet zone. Um, I am fully on board with getting this um, to the next stage this year. Um, I'm very sympathetic when other projects take longer. There's many projects I've been waiting for for many, many years. Um, and um, I think, you know, we need to look into what those kinks are. Um, but I do think that for another, we already have the 300,000 um, in carryover funds and for an additional 150,000 um, to be able to, to move on the quiet zone is, is critical. Um, I, in terms of where the funding comes from, I'm a bit agnostic. Um, I feel like it's a little bit like moving cups on a magic trick. So if we need to take some from the downtown amenity fund, I don't feel like it's a huge amount. If there's a way, like I said, to kind of scramble things, if we need to take some parking permit funds, um, if there is money to skim off some other things, um, if you wanna use general funds. So I would like staff to come back to, um, to us for how they recommend making that happen. But I would say um, I, I definitely want to see that happen. And um, I think those are my comments after, after a very robust question and answer session and lots of public comment. So um, I will now turn it over to my colleagues. Uh, looks like Councilmember Combs. Yeah, th thanks, um, Mayor Wilson. Uh, so, so a couple of uh, direction. One is uh, with regards to Willow Oaks Park. Um, so as, as I've chatted with the, um, city manager about, 
Um, I, I'd like to sort of bifurcate the the bulk of the the park project uh, from the the uh, the restrooms. I think that there is still a discussion that needs to be had in the community. So I, I'd like the restrooms to pr proceed. I'm not saying that like they not happen, but I think um, there needs to be d discussion in the community. Whereas I don't think there needs to be discussion about anything else. Um, and so wanted to to put that out there, and, and we'll start that discussion with the um, with the, the sort of uh, the, the, the pop up sort of kiosk informational kiosk that, that's going to happen this weekend with regards to the park. Are you talking about um, the discussion needs to happen about the bathrooms, or the discussion needs to happen about everything else? The discussion needs to happen about the bathrooms exclusively. I, I don't think anything has to a discussion has to be had about, um, and I, I think a community discussion. Um, uh, um, but the play structure, the paths, the dog park, um, the, the, the resurfacing of the basketball court, I, th I think that they're, they're, uh, we're, we're not going to do pickleball, um, because of noise. Uh, um, uh, but, but I, I do think, um, that there was once a, a restroom or restrooms in the park. And so there's just been lots of neighborhood so, sort of, um, uh engagement are or and and i just want to make sure that like everyone is heard from before it feels like the city has has made a decision there so um so 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 just wanted to make it clear there That's what can yeah. i ask a follow-up question sure actually i guess this is more directed towards staff um given that right now it's like bundled as one project i'd just like to know the impacts from staff's perspective of that bifurcation and if that's going to double the amount of time and effort and and how that if they can even separate them really yeah that's a great question so the way that we've set up the bid we have a bid alternate for the restroom so everything will be stubbed out with utilities um, covered with mulch on the restroom pad area. If we choose not to move forward with the restroom, um, we can just pull that out completely. Thank you. And thanks for letting me ask that question. Yeah. Um, okay. So wanted to share that. Um, also, I, I'm I'm supportive of of the, the 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 quiet zone funding request. I think that it should come from the uh, downtown amenities fund. Um, uh, I think, like I said, um, if I'm going back to the interchange um, uh, example, it was like very much as I understood it, we were we were kept to the funds that were available, and and no, and there was this like, well, we'll go out for a grant for a nicer project, but when the grant came, didn't come through, it was like, well, you have to go back to the standard project. No one ever said, well, we're going to go to general funds to make this a nicer project. So I, I think that there is a strong nexus between the amenities fund and, and quiet zone. So I I would be not supportive of, of moving forward if it's coming out of the general funds. I would be supportive if it's coming out of the downtown amenities fund. And also I think it sets what I see as a clear tradition um, um, uh, that that like that's where we should be looking to um, as, as this project ro rolls along. Um, I know that not all of the money is there, but I do think that like, you know, it's, it's important that there is a connection and, and to just say at this point that like, we're gonna go to, to the downtown amenities fund, um, uh, I, I think makes sense. Or that, to say, we'll, we'll just pull to the general fund, I, I think for me is, is a lot more problematic. Um, in theory, I, I am supportive of the mayor's ask for a study session, but then it goes back to like, for me, like, how do these things happen? Like, right. So if I'm saying I'm winning, like, like Bay Road, right, is is a scenario where the bus stops on the side opposite of where the actual crosswalk is striped. And, and that's just one of the safety improvements that need to happen on Bay Road. Um, like, where, where does that come up? Like, right. Do, and so that to, to me, then that becomes just another example of like, how things get prioritized how they ultimately um, make their way through 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 the process. And so again, I don't have any objection to, to El Camino, like a, a study session, but I'm gonna be really sort of uh, pr probably not aligned what's moving forward aggressively on that when there are other things in the city that have been identified beforehand, um, which have gotten no, no action. So 
those are my thoughts. Thanks. If I could just comment for a moment, and this might be a question for the city manager. And I have a whiteboard at my house called policies and procedures that I've just add things to and never really deal with. But I do think that the, that your point about how we raise things, what gets prioritized, um, what gets attention where and when is a valid point. Um, so I just wanted to acknowledge that. And it's something I think as a council, as we you know, get staffed up and have capacity, hopefully maybe after the budget, we can start visiting some of these um, procedures so that we all feel like it's a fair and level playing ground um, and, and we can go from there, but thank you. I would just add as the newest person on this dais, I'm excited for that conversation as well because I'm still thinking about the parks ordinance and other things and really excited to have space and figure out how to best uh, bring these other things to the dais. Thanks. Um, Council member Combs, was there anything else? Okay, thanks. And um, I actually forgot one thing when I spoke was that I am in support of um, a letter to Caltrans um, for the vice mayor's request about our dissatisfaction with the timing and whatever else council member Taylor, uh, vice mayor Taylor feels is appropriate. And then I would be open to looking at the screening and the sound walls and, and the other issues. I don't know if that gets rolled into the CIP this year or if that's just an info item or what. Um, I'll defer to staff and Vice Mayor Taylor, but I just wanted to acknowledge those requests that she made and my support again. And I'm also in support of Bay Road having a better bus stop. So, I mean, we're in support of everything at some point. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I just wanna say, and, and I could be corrected. I mean, staff doesn't do sound walls um, and and they're really expensive. So. I, but but certainly hopefully like plant, planting lots of trees um like even like I say on the the what I've told residents is is that like yeah I don't it's really unfortunate that the fence got put up in place of 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 a wall I don't know at the moment like how we correct it and again it's a it's a Caltrans right away they have to do it and and again sound walls are way more expensive than you think that they should be given <laughs> They're just, they're just bricks. But I, I do want to appreciate that, like, or at least have staff appreciate that, like, while there is some frustration, I do understand that there are, there are limits to what they can deliver. And I'm not asking for everything. Um, and I know that there's lots here out, out of out of your, your your control. I did see our public work staff whispering amongst themselves. Was there anything you wanted to share with us? They were just saying bad words about me. <laughs> Not, not at all, not at all. We, we were just conferring to make sure um, that we could keep the current design work on track so that it doesn't slow down while figuring out a parallel process to address the screening um, uh, requests that we, we heard tonight. Because hearing the comments about how long it's taken, I want to make sure that we don't um, further Do delay. not delay. Yeah, correct. I think, I think correct. So I, I think we, we probably have some homework to do um to get a, a clear picture of of what can be done in the timing uh, but we'll we'll keep the current work on on track in the meantime okay um so i think council member combs has spoken i have spoken um vice mayor taylor did you want to speak as a reminder this is our time to make any requests give any direction yes Thank you. Um, and um, my request at, on the screen, it says, is the tier designation representative of the council's goals? Um, I have the goals in front of me, housing, emergency preparedness, climate action, activating downtown and safe streets. So keeping that theme in mind, um, what I must say isn't on that list. <laughs> but um, I would like to have, and it's already in the works, is Willow Oaks Park is being a tier one. It's on here as a tier two. Um, what else? Uh, sea level rise resiliency plan um, number 16. It's on, I think it was a tier three. Um, I put it as a tier one. The urban forest master plan, I put it as a T1. It was to be determined. Let's see. Uh, the sports fields, initially I went from a tier two to a tier one, but I, I'm, my guess is it's on track. So I don't need to bump it up. 
the sports fields? That's a, a question. So I don't need to bump that up as a priority. Um, just to confirm, so there are a couple lines for sports fields renovations. Uh, 27, 29, and 30. Okay. Okay. Um, yes, yeah, so that captures uh, our typical renovation program and then the replacement at Kelly Park. Um, and 30, I don't have the right numbers on my list. Oh, Willow Oaks. Got yes. it. Thank you. And then uh, 32, which is the San Francisco Creek upstream, which I'm, it says design. It's on there as a tier three. Um, I'm asking for it to be a tier one. And then the storm system funding study, it hasn't been started. It's on as a tier three. I'm asking for it to be a tier one. And then lastly, one that we've talked about repeatedly in the past 30 minutes, um, and that is the one-on-one -on -one interchange. It's on as a tier three. I'm asking for it to be a tier one. And then my, hopefully, this will probably not be my last comment, um, but going along the lines of climate action, which is our priority, I'd like to see all of our leaf blower equipment replaced. And if that needs to be on the CIP list or some list um, funding, is it $100,000 to replace all of it? I was at a park where we had two leaf blowers at the same time. Um, it's very important that we replace them as soon as possible because they're used regularly in our city by our city staff. Thank you. Yes, thank you for, for that comment. And so the zero emission landscape equipment requests will come back through the operating budget. It, it won't be a, a capital request, but but hear, hear your feedback there. Um, and I think we got notes on the projects that you noted uh, to advance uh, it using the, the tier kind of priorities. What I would like some direction on from the council is if you're open to us identifying projects that would be reduced in tier to bring those forward uh, with higher priority. Because if what we do is bring them all to tier one and keep the rest, everything's just going to slow down and we will be having the same conversation we just had for Willow 101 with, with the, the whole project list. And so I, I very much understand that everything on this list is important and we're working to advance things as quickly as possible. But when everything is important, then in the same vein, nothing is important. So before I turn it over to the two colleagues who haven't spoken, I was going to ask that the <laughs> one more thing go to tier one, um, <laughs> which was the downtown parking lot, which I think has a TBD, um, which I'm, I mean, it's, it's okay. So that's a, it's a housing mandate. So there you go. So whatever. Okay. So, um, okay. Council member door. Thank you. Um, I also, before I go actually, uh, Vice Mayor Taylor, um, you didn't mention your thoughts on the quiet zone and I'm curious if there were any comments you had for that one. The quiet zone is, it's listed as a tier one. Um, I'm interested in the funding source. Um, be, I don't, I, it's hard for me to say, don't do it because we've already done work on it. And if we can identify the funding for it, I'd be supportive of it, but it depends on where the funds come from. Thank you. Um, starting on that one, um, I'm supportive of going ahead with another 150,000 towards that study, given that we already have 300,000 earmarked um, and moving that forward, um, given the, the health and safety. And um, I, I appreciated one person who commented on, you know, even if this didn't give us a uh, quiet zone designation, it does improve the safety of two intersections. And um, that, that seems important given one of our goals on safe streets. Um, so I'd be happy for that. Also, um, we discussed the longer construction needs. I'd be interested in exploring the TOT opportunities or TIF impact fees that could be used to support that about $4 million that would be required for the construction part of that. Um, another point um, to think about prioritizations. Um, so there are some that I also marked as tier one and other things I marked, I'd, I'd suggest we deprioritize. So the things that I marked as tier one were 
I can go through and give numbers as well. We're year one for number 18, the Burgess Campus Microgrid and Electrification. Um, someone did a, uh, assessed, you know, how much gas is being, natural gas is being used for those facilities. And there was an estimate that was rolling around uh, back of the envelope kind of guesstimate that that's a, a little over a hundred, the equivalent of the natural gas used by over a hundred homes. And so that seems like really low hanging fruit to just take care of some natural gas mit mitigation and emissions mitigation. Um, so I'd propose that that's a TBD. I'd say that I'd prefer, I'd like that to see a tier one. I'd like to see number 19, the urban forest master plan a tier one, especially as we think about the inequitable tree canopy that our city has and with special focus on district one. The other things I marked didn't, uh, tier one was 37, the downtown parking lot study, seeing that that is a priority for affordable housing um, in our plans there. And I am amenable to other tiering, but those were my priority ones that I noted and some that I suggested maybe we prioritize a bit lower are um, potentially the building exterior improvements. Um, right now that's TBD. I, I'm not sure uh, how quick that plans to be, but curious if that could be a, a tier two or tier three. Looking at the smart irrigation infrastructure, if that could be a tier two, it's currently TBD. Um, looking lower on the list, uh, the Cal Caltrain grade separation, I propose moving that from tier two to tier three, uh, given the long, long haul, long term nature of that one. And then, uh, okay, those are those are my other. Oh, and one more on the uh, forty and forty one, the Plaza seven and eight renovations. Right now, it says not started. I propose moving those to on hold. Um, I understand that we'd need those maybe renovations in the nearest medium term, um, but given the other conversations, the downtown parking lot study, I'd like to see that work done before we make a decision and start rolling out funding for that one. And one last one, uh, 28, tennis court maintenance. Could we say tennis and pickleball court maintenance? Thank you. Um, thank you, Council Member Dor. And you get gold star for demoting items instead of just elevating items. However, I did want to check with staff because I know sometimes there's timing opportunities and work that staff already has in progress. And instead of maybe answering each one and, and going through it, maybe the direction um, that I think might make sense is to have staff look at those vis-a-vis -vis their other recommendations for possible, they were gonna look into things that they could potentially demote. So kind of where they're at with their work capacity. Um, but I mean, your suggestions sound reasonable. I just wanna make sure that they're aligned with kind of, I don't want them to have to drop something that they're 90% done with. Of course, okay. that makes sense. Thank, thank you. Or that's gonna like crash if it doesn't get fixed tomorrow. Okay, anything else, uh, Council Member Dorr? No, thank you. Um, and following up, are you in support of a study session on um, El Camino? Right? Thank you. I am supportive of a study session. And, and, and I appreciate to Council Member Combs um, what you said about in the conversation about prioritization. Um, I think the new opportunity with Palo Alto moving forward on something elevates that in my mind of uh, the, the it's a new situation that we're in with that and um, would be excited for that study session. I'm also supportive of um, the parks efforts that uh, Vice Mayor Taylor mentioned in District One, and and looking at other opportunities to improve the parks there, as well as the um, letter to Caltrain Trans. Okay, thank you, Council Member Dor. Okay, so I think we're on our last Council Member. Thank you. So, um, I guess first comment is somewhat. On um, 12 and 13, which are the um, Bellhaven Child Development Center zero net energy retrofit and the building exterior improvements, I believe those are both tied to possible grants from Peninsula Clean Energy, in which case I think that they should be whatever tier you think needs they need to be to get done. 
Um, but I absolutely want to take advantage of the grants that we just are receiving from Peninsula Clean Energy on those um, projects. So, I mean, I sort of assumed they'd be tier one, but whatever, whatever it takes. But appreciate very much that otherwise they would not be. And um, I definitely support tier one for the number 18 and 19, the Burgess micro um, campus microgrid electrification. Again, I believe we're um, working to get some um, funding hopefully there. And also on the urban forest master plan, um, smart irrigation, if we can leave that as a lower tier, I don't know. I mean, again, that's only because I don't see any others that I can say that on. Um, the aquatic center maintenance number 20 is tier two. And the only reason why I'm raising it is we currently have a water heater, uh, the heat pump is out. And if, um, there are things that we can be doing to avoid getting it to the stage where things, it actually collapses. My understanding is that we, there were, um, the city was aware of it like two months in advance. And I, so I don't know if it's, and then. I don't know if that's true or not, but that's, I've heard that we were aware of it ahead of time. So if putting it at a higher tier will help make sure that things get done earlier, that would be great um, because I think it, by the time it actually breaks, um, that's probably even more trouble. And certainly you hear from people, I hear from people. Um, so totally understand that you're trying to balance everything. Um, And then, um, and thank you for all you're doing there with it. Um, downtown parking lots, um, number 37, as everyone else has said, I would definitely agree, um, tier one, please. Um, and I also agree with the comments on the Plaza 7 and Plaza 8. Um, right now it's tier three and whatever we can do to sort of limp along if need be until we decide whether or not that's um, money well spent. Um, but also understand that it may be something that we, may, we need to do just because of the timeline. The El Camino crossing improvements, which I mentioned before, um, it's tier three. I hate to say move it up because of <laughs> other comments, just whatever we can do to finish um, the work that's been started. And um, Caltrain quiet zone. So um, I would support 150, adding $150,000 from the downtown um, public amenity fund, not the 550, um, because I do think there's an implication there. And I actually um, would resist getting further money from that fund because I think it's very important to be focused downtown and um, being able to improve downtown. So I'd like to find other funding for any additional work. Um, but I think the 150,000 should come just straight from the downtown. Uh, amenity fund. And beyond that, um, I support the letter to Caltrans and the screening and sound walls because it, it, that doesn't seem like a new project. That's something that's been, I've certainly been listening to for um, all the years I've been on council. Um, leaf blowers, please, um, not only do we need to get them replaced, but we need people to use them. Um, I don't know if it's, I. I constantly around Burgess Park see people, um, see maintenance staff using the, sometimes the electric blowers, um, but often hear them, the gas blowers. So whatever we can do to um, get enough leaf blowers that are electric, that would be great. Um, I put down, I really appreciate, um, Ms. Nagaya, you articulating the all the balancing and very much appreciate it. And while we're up here, it's hard to say no to anything and not promote it. Please um, do push back on us. Please do make it um, realistic. We want it not only to have realistic timelines, but also have um, 
save our staff. <laughs> we don't, um, we do understand as others have said. Um, I am, and then the last two I have down um, on the TIF, I am not supportive of going out for a um, study only because it's yet one more thing to do unless it's needed for just more generally than the quiet zone. But I don't think it's worth, um, I personally would not support that extra staff time. And then along that same line, I am actually not supportive of the El Camino study session, um, although it may not matter, there may be enough people. And again, it's only because um, I am supportive of the project generally. I just, I do have problems with how things are getting prioritized. And um, I don't know that that's the thing that should be pushed forward. I definitely um, want to be there when Palo Alto or Atherton are getting ready, but I don't know if this is the if this is a critical time. And I think there are many other places around the city that we should be, we shouldn't just be pushing um, one project ahead of others without seeing or getting input from about the whole, um, what's the highest priority. So I am, um, I would love to look at El Camino Real and the bike lanes at some point. I just, I personally don't know that now is the right time. And I also um, am very concerned or just very anxious to complete all of the various transportation projects that we already have in the works and don't want to pull any of those staff off those to do something else that I want to get some of these over the finish line as I think you're doing. Thank you. So I just wanted to echo that, yeah, not not supportive of uh, the TIF or any sort of special assessment district, because because I just don't think it, the the time and effort is going to be worth the, the 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 money limit as far as 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 the quiet zone. I mean, if it is if it is like we're talking about four million dollars, um, I th I think those extra efforts um aren't, aren't going to be worth it. Um, I, I do have to say because I always get. Can someone remind me what are plazas seven and eight? One one of those is the the Walgreens Plaza, right? And or, or. Yes, so they are the two plazas that are closest to El Camino on the south side of Santa Cruz. Um, okay. So yeah. I'm trying to get the landmarks, but my yeah. brain's not up to, to yeah, yeah. speed right now either. <laughs> Yeah, so I just want to say those are abysmal. <laughs> so I, I um, like in almost any other instance, I'd be like, yeah, if there is some future possible pro project in, in I don't know, five years or six years or whatever, then it doesn't make sense. But it, it really is like it, it, you the some they're they're too small or too or there is a tree there and it thinks that you can park your car and. And it is really, um, it is a bit of a mess. <laughs> so I, I would just have to, you know, say in most instances, I, I would be, you know, opposed to, you know, putting good money after bad. But uh, but, but in this case, uh, I, I do understand the staffs need to pay some attention to it. And Ms. Nagaya's um, statement that like, yeah, even if it's not, if it's not going to be long for this world, it, it, it really is something we should try to address. Pardon the interruption, just given the time, we'll need to do a vote to extend this meeting beyond 11 p.m. So I'm nodding. I, I think we're okay. nodding. Yes. Thank you. I uh, just want to say I appreciate that, Council Member Combs, and that makes sense to me to, to go ahead and uh, not have it on hold, but have it as it list, is listed here. I've just not started yet. And I'm curious uh, for clarification. Um, Council Member Nash about would you, while you're not interested in exploring TIF, would you be interested in exploring TOT? Uh, um, I know that they said that we should do that between seven and 10 years, and right now we're year five. Is that that was with TIF or that was with TOT? The TOT, oh, right. the TOT Thank is you. a revenue source that we're going to be examining potential new ongoing revenue sources. And so got it. Thank you. Okay. Council member Nash. Just one clarification. I actually would be in favor of looking into assessment districts if it's something that would be um make sense. If it doesn't make sense, don't 
don't do it. Um, thank you. So at this time, um, I'd like to know if staff feels that they have the appropriate, I know we've been talking for hours and thank you for members of the public who have stuck with us or who are watching this at a later date. Um, I hope you can see how seriously we take these decisions and the type of due diligence uh, we put into these numbers. Um, as a recap or as a reminder, this conversation will feed into our budget conversations. This is a necessary hurdle. And um, as an advertisement on January, uh, January, on June 1st, there will be a budget workshop. And then we will need to approve the fiscal year 23-24 budget by June 30th. Our new fiscal year starts July 1st. So this is all part of that process. So um, asking staff, um, are we good? Do you know where to go from here? Um, so I think I know where to go, but let me just recap and make sure um, that, that we got things um, kind of itemized appropriately. So we heard direction on the Willow 101 project to follow up with a letter from Caltrans, to follow up with screening on the, particularly near the 1100 block of Willow Road, but not at the expense of delaying the overall project. Um, I heard majority support for a study session on El Camino Real bike lane. So there was some discussion about that. Uh, direction to fund two crossings for the quiet zone from the downtown amenities fund um, to roughly $150,000 for the new, new funding request. Um, I think we did not get to a majority on adding a future year study for the TIF update, if I tracked um, the numbers of, of council members correctly. Um, and then uh, I think just a general check of whether a special assessment district would be valuable. If yes, then bring something back. If no, then let it, let it be. Um, for Willow Oaks Park to bifurcate the restroom from the bid award process. Um, and then about 11 different requests to move projects up to the tier one level. And then um, staff will take the deprioritization request uh, that the council identified along with our assessment and bring back revised recommendations as part of the budget adoption. And then leaf blower equipment will be in the operating budget, but we heard heard that tonight as well. I think that was everything. Thank you, Ms. Nagaya, um, for that summary. And I wanna thank my colleagues for their thoughtful um, discussion. So the part, uh, so, uh, Vice Mayor Taylor saying parks. Oh, Carly Clark Park. Um, Ms. Nagaya, there was some comments from Vice Mayor Taylor requests about Carly Clark Park and um, Hamilton Park and the Pocket Park for doing some improvements. Yes, thank you. Sorry, that was my handwritten list and not the typed list. Um, so uh, we will um, circle back to some opportunities for scoping projects at those parks. Um, so I think we probably want to think through what that sequencing looks like. So we have the right kind of community engagement process and, and sequencing. Um, but uh, yes, we have that one as well. Thank you. Um, okay, so I'm looking at my notes and it says that the mayor is supposed to recap the direction to staff. But I think thankfully, Ms. Nagaya, you have accomplished that task for me. I'm extremely grateful. So I'm gonna move on from this item. Um, I think we're gonna, is it burning? Okay. I just wanted to thank the public for all their um, efforts with the quiet zone and see if you could now put some of those efforts towards brainstorming about funding. Thank you. Fabulous. Okay, that was worth you making that comment. Okay, we're moving on to K. Informational items. Informational items are transmitted to the city council and staff's effort to provide an update on matters of importance to the city council. Informational items are not action items. However, a city council member, city staff member, or a member of the public may request to make a comment or ask a question on any of the informational items. City Clerk Karen, do we have any public comments on the informational items? 
Thank you, Mayor Willison. So at this time, if any member of the public wishes to provide comment on any of our informational items, K-1, City Council agenda topics, K-2, Transmittal of City Attorney billing, K-3, update on the pilot quick build at Menlo Ave and University Drive, or K-4, update on the Willow Road US 101 interchange landscaping. If participating virtually, please engage that hand feature in the bottom of your screen. Calling in from a landline or a cell phone, please press star nine. If participating in chambers, please complete a speaker card and return it to the clerk's desk. And our first speaker will be Pam Jones. Pam, if you could let us know which item you are speaking on, please. Uh, yes, good evening, almost good morning, um, K4. Um, and I, I really appreciate the discussion that you've had and the work that's being done to make sure we have a you know, good, solid, healthy um, uh, budget. Um, what triggered this comment is when I read about the four trees in the medium, blah, 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 and, and I appreciate you, Count, uh, Council Member Combs, for bringing that up, and also Vice Mayor uh, Taylor for bringing this item up under the CIP. Um, but what it reminded me of is that the reality is this is an environmental justice issue. And that's because it, um, it affects the quality, our air quality. We know that, let alone the noise quality. And it also reminded me of why these freeways were built the way they are and question what Caltrans thought they were doing when they um, did the overpass because um, the, that overpass is worse than it ever was before. And um, anyway, but I think it's important to know that because of what happened in 1954, I know folks don't like to do history, but because of what happened with freeways, with the Freeway Act of 1954, we now have $1 billion um, for highways to correct the problems that were created early on. And I would imagine that some of that money um, could be that we would be eligible for some of that money. Okay, look, so I'm gonna go back and tell you why. Um, when 101 was built, uh, being discussed in 1954, the NAACP was very clear and attempted to stop it because they saw it as a concrete curtain. It separated Belhaven um, Haven from the rest of Menlo Park. That was when that, that happened and there was federal funds to build these freeways. So it wasn't an accident. You know, it didn't happen by accident. So considering that to correct all the other freeways, and ours was not the worst, um, but to correct those things that were done in the 50s, that's why there's one billion, with a B, dollars in the transportation fund, the federal transportation fund, to correct some of these things. And I'm certain that we could be funded that way to put up sound walls, you know, to get rid of the screens. Um, and to plant real trees so that, because um, uh, we can plant trees with roots, you know, six foot trees with roots. And it's just a matter of having money. Um, so this, my comments are not directed towards the staff or this council because um, the issues that, that we have today were created by a whole different group of people um, back in a different time. Uh, so, it, so thank you. And again, thank you for the work that you have been doing this evening. I've learned a lot. Thank you for your comment. And this is the final call for public comment on our informational items K-1 through K-4. Seeing none, Mara Willison, you may continue. Thank you, Speaker Karen. And thank you, Ms. Jones, for um, that history and for um, letting us know about the potential funding source. Um, so uh, my colleagues, are there any comments or questions about any of the info items? I know we already had a discussion about Willow 101. I'm seeing Council Member Nash. So there was a um, CCIN request that I didn't know the answer to either. How do cyclists, I'm sorry, this is on K3, update on the pilot quick build intersection improvements at Menlo Avenue and University Drive. And how do cyclists navigate the intersection? And I'm wondering, rather than explain tonight, can you just answer publicly to the CCIN or would you rather explain tonight? If it's easy. I mean, I think it's fairly straightforward, which Great. is that Thank you. the 
you know, right now there's no bicycle facilities. This isn't removing a bicycle facility right now. This is, it's removing a turn pocket. Um, and so, and the, the uh, bulb outs will be just posts. So bicyclists could actually use that space in the short term. And then we can, when we think about what the long term is after the pilot, that's when we'll sort of get into that question a little bit more detail. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Nash. I'm not seeing any other comments or questions on the informational items. So we are going to move on to L, which is our city manager's report. City Manager Murphy. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I have no uh, specific updates this evening. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, City Manager Murphy. Council member reports. Item M, are there any reports from city council members since the April 25th, 2023 council meeting? I think we're, we're tired, uh, except for council member Nash, please. There was a PCE meeting um, that where we had a excellent discussion about diversity, equity, accessibility, and inclusion. Um, PCE, Peninsula Clean Energy has done an excellent job um, with a consultant on that matter. Um, and also a good discussion on the sunsetting of the NEM2, which is the net energy metering, NEM2 and the transition to NEM3. And there's much more information that will be coming out um, once people figure out all of what it means. Thank you. Thank you. Vice Mayor Taylor. Thank you. Um, I am on CCAG and I'm also on the equity subcommittee for CCAG. We met last week. I've asked the city clerk to attach the presentation um, on the equity assessment and framework development project, which includes project updates, equity focus area mapping, existing conditions analysis, discussion and feedback. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor Taylor. Um, I'm seeing council member Dorr. Uh, just to plug that there's an event that's this Thursday that I'll be attending called Lessons Learned from the Storms, Preparing for the Future at Trinity Hall from 7 to 8.30. Um, and so it's talking about the power outages we experienced, how we as neighbors can support one another, and um, what other things can be done to uh, help our community during these emergencies. Uh, so hope to see you there. Councilmember Nash, do you have anything else? I'm not. Um, just a reminder to people that um, the Finance and Audit Committee, we have two vacancies open right now, and the deadline is this Friday at 5 p.m. Thank you. And I just want to let people know, uh, remind folks that I am holding weekly, most weekly, um, Zoom office hours on Fridays at noon, and you can register at jenwallison.com. And I'm also going to be holding my quarterly in person office hours on Saturday, May 20th at 10 a.m. at Cafe Baroni. Um, so uh, anything else? Councilmember Combs. Well, since we're, uh, uh, I, I hold weekly office hours <laughs> at, at Cafe Zoe in person, <laughs> no, no Zoom, uh, from uh, sat every Saturday from 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. So come while, while my kids are in uh, ballet class. So, <laughs> so, so, so come, come and say hi. And if we're doing that, my office hours are Tuesdays, 8 to 9.30. Uh, if, if I'm not there, it's posted in my email, so you can reach out to me to ensure I'm there. Um, but 8 to 9.30 on Tuesday mornings at Woodside Bakery in Sharon Heights. And I know that this council is very interested in being accessible to residents and constituents. So if anyone wants to reach out to any of us at any time, I'm sure all of us will make ourselves available to anyone with limitations. I was just going to say, yes, please email me. I'm available um, on demand. <laughs> All right. And with that, uh, let me make sure. Oh, no, I'm not closing yet. We have a closed session. The council is not done. So item N is closed session. And we are going to reopen public comment on the closed session items N1 and N2. So uh, City Clerk Karen, can you please call for public comment on closed session items? Yes, thank you, Mayor Willison. So at this time, if any member of the public wishes to provide comment on our closed session items, N1, study session conference with legal negotiators, or N2, conference with legal counsel regarding existing litigation, please engage that hand feature in the bottom of your screen. If you're calling in from a landline or a cell phone, please press star nine. If participating in person, please complete a speaker card at that back table and return to the clerk's desk. 
And this is the final call for public comment on closed session items N1 and N2. Seeing none, Mayor Willison, you may continue. Thank you. Um, so it is now 1116 and the city council will be adjourning this regular meeting and reconvening in closed session. The closed session report out, if any, will occur at the May 23rd city council meeting. Good night.